um, and it will make a, a short opening ceremony. Um, and for this, I would like to invite um, up here um, Professor Luis Levitovich, President of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. Um, Professor Volker, President of, the, of IAP, the Inter-Academy Partnership. Professor Mohamed Hassan, President of TWAS. Professor Elisa Heish, Vice President of the International Science Council. And Professor Alfredo Tomaskin from the Museum of Tomorrow. So welcome everybody, uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here. I would like to thank all our visitors that came from other countries to participate in this conference, for coming here, uh, welcome to, to Rio de Janeiro, welcome to Brazil. I'm quite sure this, this will be a very interesting uh, workshop on a, on a very important problem, which uh, claims for the uh, interaction between several countries and which is a challenge for academies of science, uh, scientific societies. It is one of the most pressing problems in the world since uh, it is at the origin of many serious other problems that we have today. So uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank and uh, give a special thank actually to uh, my colleagues who are in this uh, opening session uh, today. Uh, Professor Folk Termoylen, who is the co-chair of IAP, the Inter-Academy Partnership. IAP has been a supporter of this committee on science for, for poverty eradication. Brazil is the chair of this committee, uh, and it's a committee of IAP. Uh, I would like also to uh, acknowledge and to thank the presence of Mohamed Hassan, who is the president of, of TWAS. He's my boss now because I'm secretary general of TWAS. So, <laughs> so welcome here. Uh, Elisa Reis, she is the vice president of the International Science Council. And more than that, she was really the coordinator of this, uh, this meeting. She's a member of the uh, SPEC committee of, uh, of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. We have another member here, who is Ricardo Paes Barros, uh, who is going to give a, uh, participate in a session with us uh, in, this, in this workshop. Uh, thank also Mauricio Tomaskin, this Alfredo Tomaskin, the uh, Mauricio's is brother, twin brother. <laughs> yeah. So Alfredo Tomaskin, who is the scientific director of the Museum of Tomorrow and who has uh, uh, made it possible for us to use this fantastic space, uh, which has uh, something in common, I think, with academies of science and scientific unions, because uh, it's, it, it looks to tomorrow. It's a museum of tomorrow. And actually, uh, we in our academies and in our scientific societies, we are also looking to tomorrow uh, and, and trying try to, to help, help society uh, to uh, have, have a better, better tomorrow. tomorrow. Uh, I would like also to acknowledge the presence here of Lucia Priviato, who is the Vice President uh, of the Brazilian Academy of Science for Rio de Janeiro. Uh, so, uh, without further uh, uh, delays, uh, let me just uh, ask uh, now our, my colleagues here in the opening session to, to, to give, give some, some words about, about these events and uh, for the opening of the session. session. So, so first, I would like to ask my friend Folker to, to talk, talk some, some words about this. Thank you, Luis. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of IAP, the Inter-Academy Partnership. 
that you came here to discuss, as Luis has already pointed out, a very important issue. As you may know, IAP, since a number of years, is very much engaged in SDGs, and SDGs also on the basis of poverty and all what is related to it. And this is a project which is supported by the Carnegie Trust in the U.S., and uh, I hope that probably a number of you are also coming to Seoul in about 10 days, where we will have our science meeting on the SDGs and the academies in relation to what academies can do to these important issues. So I, I consider this an important meeting we have here in Brazil, and uh, I'm looking very much forward that, uh, to, to all the presentation we have. I thank the president of this academy to have taken the initiative to get us here together. And I hope we will have a very interesting two days with interesting discussion and new information which will help us in our own work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Volker. And now I would like to Mohammed Hassan to, to say some words. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Luis. Uh, and by the way, the Secretary General in Tuas is the most influential post, uh, because that post controls the programs and the activities and gives reports about, about those. So I don't know whether I am your boss or you are my boss. <laughs> um, well, Tuas itself um, has a, a very rich history with the Brazilian scientific community. And if I can just say a few words about that. You know, the beginning of Tuas was um, a meeting in Rome of seven scientists from developing countries who signed a memorandum to establish the, world, the third World Academy of Sciences at that time. Three out of the seven are Brazilians. And uh, these three include the only woman, the only lady, who actually was a founder of TWAS, uh, Dobaraina, a very famous agricultural scientist. She was the only, the only woman who founded it, among all these men, who was a founder of TWAS. Um, secondly, uh, TWAS had so far six presidents. I am now, I'm now the last president, and I took over in January. Two out of the six presidents were Brazilians. That's in addition to U.S. Secretary General. So the history of TWAS and the current programs and activities of TWAS are very much linked with Brazil. I'm very, very happy, and we are all very proud that Brazil has taken such an active uh, role in not only the foundation of TWAS, but also in the programs and activities of TWAS. And by the way, I might also add, the only president of a country who was a founding member of TWAS was in Brazil. Uh, and that is um, uh, Cardoso. President Cardoso was one of the founders of TWAS, and, uh, and he was very active in TWAS affairs. So I'm very, very delighted to be here uh, to represent TWAS, and I really thank you for the invitation, for the very kind invitation. Um, uh, the topic itself, uh, topic of science and technology and innovation for poverty alleviation is a very important topic for TWAS. In fact, the countries that TWAS is trying to serve mostly are the poorest countries in the world. So most of the programs that TWAS runs, and I will say a few words about, about this day after tomorrow, uh, are really focusing on the poorest countries on this planet. So the link between the topic and what TWAS is doing a very strong. So, so for that, that, I also thank you for inviting me to say a few words about that. that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mohamed. Uh, you mentioned Joana Doberaina. I consider her a scientific hero of Brazil. Uh, thanks to her, the productivity of soya beans, for instance, was multiplied by at least four. Uh, and and uh, I think you, maybe you, you, you saw a video which was showing up uh, there. And uh, that's a video on Joana do Beraia. We are producing a series of two minutes videos for the media. <laughs> and, and the first one, social media. And, and the first one was on Joana do Beraia. And the second was on Adm Admiral Alvaro Alberto, who was uh, president of the Brazilian Academy of Science and the founder of CNPq. So um, we are going to have a series of videos like that to show the the great scientists that have done a lot to benefit Brazilian society. So uh, now, I'll, I'll, like Elisa Hayes. Is it on? Yeah. OK, 
Okay, good morning, everybody. My warm welcome to colleagues, dear colleagues from here and from abroad. Uh, also, my warm welcome to the public. It's a great pleasure to be here as vice president of the International Science Council, because as some of you know, the Council is a new organization that reflects the merger of social science and, should I say, hard science. Uh, I think to, to tackle the SDGs, it's crucial to have this combination of social science and other scientists, because after all, science, the moral meaning of science is to serve society. And to serve society, we do need the conjunction of the two sorts of science. Uh, our president, Dr. Dyer Reddy, will be here later in the program. But in his own name and the name of the International Science Council, I want to renew my thanks and to say that I, we really look forward to this, this wonderful opportunity to discuss two of the most pressing issues society faces today. It's also a great pleasure to me to note that uh, we are all intermingled, IAP, ISC, Brazilian Academy, to us, because science is actually a community. Much before the world started talking about globalization, we were already a global community of scientists working to better serve society. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, good morning, welcome to all. Uh, first of all, uh, sorry for my poor English. Uh, we are very glad to have this uh, workshop, this seminar here. It's a term, first of all, uh, our partnership with the Brazilian Academy of Science, the Museum of Tomorrow, it's very new. And the Academy was one of our first partners. Uh, and we have been making many joint and fruitful activities. And so for us, it's a very honor, uh, this kind of uh, collaboration. The Museum of Tomorrow, uh, it's a science museum but not to deal with science concept, but to show to the visitor, using, based on science knowledge, what are our scenarios for the future, and to demand from the visitor to think about which kind of tomorrow he, he or she wants to have and what they are ready to do to have this kind of tomorrow. So, uh, uh, to, it's a, a place, a venue to ask people to think about our future as members of the human species, as members of the society, and members of an appetite of the Earth planet and what we should do together. So this theme of the poverty and it's very keen to the, to the museum and I hope we have a very fruitful work here these uh, days. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this is the end of the opening session. Uh, so let's take uh, our play. And, and now we are sharp on time for the first lecture. Okay, for um, our first um, key lecture, um, that, that will, will be, be on reflections, reflections on, on poverty, inequality, inequality and science. Uh, we, we have, have the, the privilege to have here with us Professor Ismael Sirajgelton. Um, he is who's the founder and director of the Library of Alexandria.
Good morning, everybody, and uh, I am very, very honored to be here and to meet old friends and make new ones and try to bring what I can to this important topic. Some of you may wonder why I put some wheat up there. The reason is that very quickly it will become apparent that there is no way of dealing with the issues at hand without, in fact, transforming agriculture and specifically agriculture at the smallholder level in the developing world. So let me run through a lot of materials because it is true, as was said on your uh, communications, that the interactions among the SDGs are fairly complicated. But to make it simple, uh, every time you see a red slide like that, you will know that I'm starting a new topic and also that I'm getting closer to the end for those who are concerned. But now, please fasten your seatbelt, and we're going to go on a very wild ride. Uh, science. I'm a great believer. Nothing good in the world has come about except through science. And science can feed the hungry and heal the sick and protect the environment and ensure the dignity of work and, in fact, connect the world and give us space for the joy of self-expression. Uh, science, science and technology, and technology can, can do so, so much, and, and thus behind the, the United Nations um, Sustainable, Sustainable Development Goals is a program of action for each of the 17 goals that is to be monitored by over 160 indicators, many of whom we still don't have the capacity to develop because we either lack the data or lack the technology. There's these little red bars that you see here. But no poverty. Objective number one, clear cut, but I have to add objective number two, because hunger is very closely associated with extreme poverty. And thus, it would not make sense to ignore one from the other. And uh, indeed, uh, this is part of what we will do. But you also asked me to look at the issue of inequality. Inequality, not just as gender inequality, but wealth inequality, income inequality, social inequality, etc. So we'll look at that, and we'll start by diagnosing poverty. Well, uh, there's absolute and relative poverty, there's many other aspects of poverty. So let me start out with the absolute and relative poverty. Every country, including the richest countries, have a level of poor people. But in general, in international affairs, we talk about a dollar a day people. Uh, that, that actually, actually is down to $1.90 per day per, per day per person nowadays, nowadays which, which in contemporary terms would be $2.12 in 2019 dollars, but it still started in the 1990s, 1996 to be precise, with the World Bank estimate of a dollar a day as a cutoff line. But when you look at all of that, you find one thing that is really stunning. Practically everybody has converged towards 2011, except for the two top line, South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And Sub-Saharan Africa, although it had a much smaller population than South Asia at the time, has a higher number of people, as you can see. So we have a problem, and that problem continues. Now, relative poverty is within any society. And we used, when I was at the World Bank, uh, we used to look at the income distribution in that country and we would say the lower 40% of the income distribution or someone who has less than 60% of the median income per person in that country and that these deserve special help. But, uh, you know, I wonder whether we could just turn off this set of lights that are on the screen here because they're really washing away the, the uh, images. If you get just the first tier of lights here, I think you will see much better images. Uh, so poverty is not about income or money. For example, I was very clearly, uh, when I was at Harvard as a graduate student, I was broke, didn't have any money. Wondered whether we could pool our resources to get a hamburger together and split it in two and so on. But I was not poor in the sense of marginalization for society. On the contrary, I was considered a member of the elite of society, someone whose voice would be heard, whose participation was feasible, whose 
opinions mattered and who had a bright future to look up to as soon as I graduate. So the absence of money by itself is not enough. In fact, it is deprivation, dispossession, and societal marginalization. Yes, most of the time it is associated with extreme poverty, but it is more than that that does it. Social exclusion, deprivation, and loss of dignity when people have to beg or feel totally left to their own devices, as we see among the homeless in some of the richest societies in the world. But what about rural and urban poverty? They are different. But can we reach them? Can we understand them? Well, most of the international organizations say that 70% of the poor exist in uh, the rural areas. Uh, Actually, Actually, others, others like, like Oxford, Oxford and, and uh, others, others who have been using the multidimensional poverty, poverty index, index, the MPI, say, say it is closer to 85% of the extreme poor that are found in rural areas. areas. Now you, you begin, begin to see why the stocks of wheat and, and the importance of agriculture, because in rural areas, areas if, if we're, we're not, not going, going to deal with the problem of the smallholder farmers, farmers and the landless farm workers in rural areas, we are not, not going, going to reach the target populations we want to reach. So the ultra-poor pose another problem that was very brilliantly uh, discussed by Sir Parta Dasgupta in a great work. Uh, ultra-poor people like that, or like this. Uh, as he said in that book, he says, you cannot rely on market solutions to solve their problem. Market solutions assumes choice, they have, they have no, no choice. choice, they just, just have, have to take, take whatever they can immediately because they may go hungry, hungry. even with, with that, that, they may not get enough. And, and therefore, the market mechanisms that don't work, work. There, there has to be an outreach program for the ultra poor. They, they don't, don't respond to market signals, signals and they, they have, have hardly anything that they can valorize unless we provide the incentive structures around it. And this is really a stunning picture, and I will use it one more time. For me, to look, to look at, at a picture, picture like that and be reminded that, that close to a billion people live in that condition in the world is a devastating, devastating thought. thought. A, a devastating, devastating thought, thought, especially when the, the focus, focus tends to be on how many billionaires exist in China, how many billionaires in America, how many billionaires elsewhere. elsewhere. So, so we have uh, uh, serious problems there. Now, why, now, why is, is that, that not working? working? Because, because economists have taken over. over. And in, in fact, fact, Muhammad Hassan, Hassan may remember at the it was my, my eloquent plea on what was termed the NES, non-economic social sciences, and how we needed them in the institution, and they couldn't let it be. Why? Because the economists see social issues as the social impacts of economic policies, and that's not true. In fact, uh, I like this guy who is an unemployed economist, who says, says this sucks. sucks. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's a sort a of a, a, his, his view of how the system was working. working. But, but fundamentally, fundamentally, you need social inputs into development decisions. decisions. And, and social policy is more than working, working out the social impacts of economic policy. policy. And, and uh, we, we should, should have, every country should have social policy and social objectives in addition to economic policy and economic objectives. What would be social objectives? Well, for example, Social cohesion, to maintain social cohesion in the country, to deal with equity, to reach out to the ultra poor, to think of our cultural identity, uh, promote participation, promote mobility, facilitate mobility, geographical, intergenerational, gender, occupational, etc., to support institutional development. All of these are non economic goals. They are primarily social goals that every society should have. And to enable participatory social research, I think, is very important because that frequently brings about, first of all, better understanding of the issues, but also involvement of the people themselves in enlightening the researchers about what would work and what wouldn't work in terms of dealing with their problems. So uh, that's how we diagnose poverty. But let's face it, most of the time we go back to income. A poverty, poverty line, line usually, usually, people, people below, below a certain, certain income. income. So, so there, there are many, many kinds, kinds of poverty, poverty as we said, said but, but in the, the final, final analysis, analysis, we tend to go to income. income. Now, uh, 
Although all recognize the multidimensional character, we go back to defining it in terms of income or expenditure, consumption expenditure. We have much improved by using household surveys, but that's still not enough. And despite our reservations on income, uh, we continue to use GDP per capita as the single most important indicators in practically any discussion around the world. Now, just to tell you that we are still way from where we should be, not only is this fundamentally wrong, and a lot of people, uh, including myself, have written a lot about why these calculations are erroneous, but uh, it is there. <laughs> it's been around since the 1930s, and therefore it's, you have a profound problem dealing with it. But there's also a, a separate issue related to that. How is it that after all these discussions from the Millennium Development Goals in 2000, to the Sustainable, sustainable development, development Goals in 15, and, and reaching uh, now into 19, so we're already well beyond the 2015, we still don't have an agreed number of how many people are in poverty. We don't have an agreed number of how many people are in extreme poverty, how many people are hungry. I mean, just to put it simply, just the volume, the number, there are disagreements, 1.4 billion, 1.6 billion, 738 million, all of these are published estimates that I looked up before this presentation and from different agencies using different numbers. So you think we need to do something about that. Now, GDP is different from GNP, and GNP is very important. It's the gross national product that includes cross-border transfers on the monetary side. And that would mean, for example, that uh, you can have uh, changes in quality, quantity, and relative prices uh, in GDP measures, and you can have, for example, uh, a new mining project that is open in the country, so it does generate some jobs, okay, that adds to GDP, but if all the money is going out to a foreign corporation, and what's more, they leave behind environmental problems, and they leave environmental damage, then, in fact, the net, the net result, result of the investment, investment may, may well turn, turn out to be negative. negative. So, so we, we need to have, have a much better understanding of these kinds of issues. issues. That's, that's the part the here about GDP versus GNP that, that I just mentioned right, right now, resource depletion and the like. But, but even leaving aside who owns what, what just, just let's look, look at what it is that we're counting and how we count it. Well, one thing is very hard to capture quality changes and price changes. You all know that GDP is a calculation of production multiplied by prices as a value-added system and uh, until you reach the overall structure of the national economy. So, for example, your mobile phone, the price has gone down, but it can do so much more than the old phone. Uh, the number of units produced where and sold at a particular price is not really measuring the same thing from year to year. Yet we, we use that. It's not, not. and uh, that's, that's what, what the original, original mobile, mobile phones look like. like. Can anybody, anybody remember those? those? <laughs> yeah, yeah, some, some of us still, some, still, some of us are old, old enough, enough to remember these. these. But, but this, this is a picture I love. love. Look, look at the, the guy, guy on the right. right. All, All that, that equipment, equipment is now part of the mobile phone, phone smartphone. smartphone. And, and we still call it smartphone. We don't call it a combination radio and the viewer and, and, and. So what is it that fits? So, so that's, that's one, one example. example, but there, but there are many, many other, other examples. examples. The, the worst, worst of these is, is services. Now, now services, services are a bigger and bigger and bigger, and bigger part of the national, national economy, economy in practically every country. country. In fact, the estimation, the estimation of how, how to count the value, value of services, services is very difficult. difficult. I mean, I don't, I don't know whether Charlie, Charlie Brown feels he's getting his, his nickels, nickels worth by going, going to Lucy or psychiatric, or psychiatric help, help, but services, services are very difficult to estimate. So people say, well, if, I, if this doctor charges uh, $10,000 to do an appendix and that doctor charges $1,000, there's got to be something, reputation, greater self-confidence in the, in the, in the, that, that makes somebody want to pay $10,000. Uh, rather, rather than thousand dollars, so we so just assume that this is the correct, correct value for the service being rendered. rendered. Now uh, that, that works as long as as long as, as, long as, as you have, have a market, market clearing, clearing mechanism. mechanism. In, In other, other words, 
the number of appendices being taken out by a number of doctors that are there, and in the end, people go to the ones they can afford, etc., etc. But what if you don't have, you don't have market clearing mechanisms? Like what? Well, above all, it is the mix between public services from provision of education, of health, of, uh, of sports, of many other things that are provided by government, including, above all, the most uh, uh, difficult part of come to the administration. But let's say here, even if you look at something like health, we tend to measure it by inputs, not outputs. In other words, how many hospitals have we built, how many beds, how many doctors, how many nurses. Not, not how many, many successful, successful operations there were, were, how, how many, many people have been reached with vaccine, vaccine and so on. That's, That's not, not the way we calculate the, the, the GNP, GDP. Now, now the, the reason, reason all this is important is because if at the end of the day we come and say there's a line that cuts across here and below that are the poor and above that are the non-poor, then we better know what it is that we are putting the line across. So the biggest problem is really government services. It has, it has grown, grown in the last 50, 50 years from about 20% of, of total, total to 45% of, of total economy. economy. Now, what, what does, does the government, government provide? Provide, provide something, something, otherwise, otherwise we, would we would not have, have governments, governments and pay taxes, taxes but it's very, very, very difficult to say exactly, exactly what they, they do. do. And, and if, if you come from, from my country, country Egypt, Egypt, you would say, get, get rid of all the bureaucrats. <laughs> the endless, endless red, red tape, tape and so, and so on, on uh, that they are interfering with the economy, economy. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Regulation, Regulation is also needed, we know that. But, but fundamentally, it is being taken as a consensus that we will use an approximation of the wage bill. With a slight minor tweak. Now that is absurd, because if you said that this, you really believe that, then you would double production double productivity, productivity without, without training, without, without equipment, equipment, without changing, changing anything in, 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 in uh, the procedures, procedures just, just by, by doubling, doubling the salaries of the civil servants, servants which, which nobody, nobody does. does. So, so everybody is accepting that kind of proxy measure. measure. And, and it may have been all right when it was 5, 10 percent of the total. total. But hey, we're, we're closer to 45 percent. So that margin is just huge. And we get to the unremunerated labor, which, which is, is one, one of the, the biggest, biggest uh, how shall I say this, the biggest uh, mistreatment of women in the world. Most, most of unremunerated labor in most economies is women's labor. labor. Whether in the fields or in the house. And, and as a result, result uh, that, that is not counted. counted. And, and uh, so, so the story about if, if a person has a man, a man has a, a cook, a maid, a babysitter, and a housekeeper, and he pays them all salaries. That's, that's part, part of GDP. But, but if he marries one who takes on this task, task then, then all of that all drops, drops out of GDP. GDP. So his marriage brings down GDP. On the other hand, if he marries a woman who has a career where she works, and she hires the housekeeper, the cook, the maid, and the babysitter, then it increases GDP. So you have all these peculiarities that are there that are really great. You have the issue of environment. Believe it or not, a forest standing up counts for zero. If you chop it down, it adds positive contribution to GDP. So why are we still using GDP? Well, because it's there. It started in the 1930s. And it could have gone, or Simon Kuznets, Richard Stone, and these guys, and it could have gone either towards well-being or towards production. But when the Second World War came, production was everything the governments were interested in. So the huge boost that came to government statistics during the Second World War really sealed the fate of GDP to becoming a production-based measure. And a single measure of flow not of stocks, so which leads to a lot of peculiarities. Governments routinely do something that if you were a private corporation and you did, they would throw you in jail. I'm serious, throw you in jail, which is to
to sell off assets and count them as revenue and income. Example of the forest. So because you don't have, the, the governments don't provide a balance sheet. A corporation has to provide a balance sheet in addition to a revenue and expenditure statement. So nobody knows what's going on in the economy because you have a revenue and expenditure statement. But in the revenues, you count the sale of assets, which if you were a private corporation, you would not be allowed to do. So anyway, that's part of the example. The other problems we have is, okay, we have different countries that have different currencies. How do we compare them, which is what we enjoy doing so much in the UN and the World Bank and other places? Well, uh, there are two general methods, PPP, purchasing power parity, and uh, the exchange rate method. Actually, it makes a huge difference which one you use. This is in terms of uh, purchasing power parity, and you can see that according to that, already China has surpassed the United States. But according to other measures that are based on the real exchange rate, uh, as established internationally, it has not happened. So why are we bothered with all of this? Is because we need to go back to the issue we started with, which is well-being of people. And we scientists who work on data sets, who work on analysis, have a responsibility to bring back that shift. And there are several very distinguished people, including Amartya Sen, Joseph Stiglitz, uh, Jean-Pierre Fitoussi, who, who wrote that report actually to President Sarkozy at the time, beautifully called Mismeasuring Our Lives and Why the GDP Doesn't Add Up. Uh, and they have many recommendations on what to do. Uh, but the scientific community has got to come up with a consensus position that is better than what we have today. Now, when measuring material well-being, look at the income and consumption rather than production, emphasize the household perspective, consider income and consumption jointly with wealth. Now, we haven't talked about wealth. And that is because it's a really disgusting story. And here I come to wealth. I wrote this many years ago when I was trying to change the national income accounts, 1993, I was vice president of the World Bank for Environment. I talked to the UN on the new system of national accounts, and we wanted to go to green accounting, net out the environmental impacts, add costs to carbon emissions, etc. We did not succeed, but we succeeded in getting environmental accounts as what they call satellite accounts. In other words, countries can do them or not do them, it doesn't matter. We keep the old system going, and if you want all your new additions, you can do them as a separate thing next to it. Okay, so there are four kinds of capital. And this is very important because it's a new way of defining sustainability. You define sustainability as opportunity. And what is opportunity? It is capital per capita. If my son has more capital than I do, then he can have a higher probability of generating uh, uh, both services and income stream than I do. Now, but what kind of capital? Well, this is the produced assets, the conventional one, building roads, buses, etc. This is natural capital, and here we don't just count trees that can be cut down. We count environmental services that come from having these trees, biodiversity, etc. Then there is human capital. Now, human capital is embedded in me. It's education, health, and nutrition, and if I migrate, I take it with me. On the other hand, there is social capital, and that is the glue that holds a society together, that allows a society to legislate, to have a democratic system, not to go to war all the time. And uh, we can, these four kinds of capital, therefore, can grow over time, so I can leave my son a bigger chunk of four kinds of capital, uh, although the way we're dealing with climate change right now, <laughs> we may wipe out a good part of that, but that's, and the mix between them will change but you can't drive any of them to zero. So the mix can change, but boundaries have to be respected. So these are uh, things on our research agenda that we haven't done a good enough job on as scientists, and we really need to look into and see what we do. Now, measuring poverty, there are usually three measures dealing with income, expenditure, or money, which deals with the headcount index, the depth of poverty, and the foster greer thorbecker index, or the uh, FGT index. Now, that, the headcount index is the most common one. Everybody uses it. I have 30% of the population is below the poverty line. Um, that's just headcount. 
and uh, it assumes that I can determine a poverty line. And having determined it, I can even use it to compare different groups within a population like this, for example, looking at the United States households from American Indians or blacks or Hispanics or national average or whites, etc. How many, what's the percentage for them that are below the poverty line? But then there is the depth of poverty because the key question, as somebody said, uh, how far below the poverty line are they? I mean, are they just below the poverty line and need a little bit of a push to get them all across? Or they're way down at the bottom? Uh, frequently, when you have, like, for example, in South Africa, you had a bipolar distribution uh, because of the whites and the blacks and the previous history of apartheid, and the distances were very large. And one measure of that, the gap, the poverty gap, is to say how much would I have to transfer from the top group to the bottom group to bring everybody up to the poverty line. Then uh, Jim Foster and Green and Thorbecker came up with this magnificent index, uh, which is called the FGT index or the P alpha coefficient. What it does have is this little alpha that you see here. And uh, if alpha is set to zero, it collapses into the headcount index. If alpha is set at one, it brings you the poverty gap measure. And if alpha equals two, well, it brings you, if you want statistics, the mean of squared proportion poverty gaps. What does that mean? It means this. I like to say the first one is the amount, the second one is the depth of poverty, and the third one is the severity of poverty. It is highly correlated with hunger. If you look at the number of people who are deemed to have to be chronically malnourished and the number of people who are identified by, by the P2, it's very close. So the use of these indices, however, do not tell us much about inequality in the broad sense. Why? Because we're talking about the poor. We haven't brought in the rich, the rest of society. And inequality tends to be between the rich and the poor and the rest of society. Amatia and James Foster, uh, Amatia was arguing for much more attention to inequality. Jim Foster, of course, did the work that I mentioned uh, on that great index. So links to inequality and belong in the whole population. You bring in the whole population, not just the poor. To measure inequality, uh, it, it really captures the feeling that most people around the world have. Most people around the world feel that the rich are stomping all over them, not to say defecating on them, and they don't care about them. And guess what? They're right. I'll prove it with the statistics now. <laughs> now let's look at the real numbers. And uh, we find these are the richest country in the world. United States has 41.5% of the total global wealth. Now we're talking wealth. 41.5%. And yet, 80% of that belongs to the rich and not to the bottom 50%. And surprisingly, Sweden, which we normally think of as a more egalitarian society, is right up there with the US and the UK. So we have, this is the, 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 the richest and the most unequal societies everywhere. And in fact, this is a very stunning thing, and it may explain a lot about Mr. Trump's election, is uh, if you look at the, this graph which shows the share of the total income. Now, the, the, the bottom, uh, from the left-hand side, the bottom red is the, the top 1% of society. Okay? And the yellow is the bottom 50% of society. 1%, 50% of society. Go back to 1980, which is the, the arrival of Reagan and Thatcher, who started selling us the view that governs best, governs least, uh, let the private sector do it, etc., etc., etc. Then you end up with, in fact, that the bottom 50% decline from 19.20% to 12.5%, while the top 1% more than double. They go from 10 to 20 point something. Uh, people feel that. I mean, they may not have the statistics to analyze it, but they feel that they have been on a downward slide 
for 35 years. For the first time, you have Americans responding, saying that I don't think my son will be living better than I am. This was a big thing that happened because the American dream, etc., etc. For the first time, you see this. But if you see that analysis, it's very clear. They have lost a huge amount. And the top 1% that were kind of identified by the Occupy Wall Street examples have done that. So inequality is really a serious issue. And the enormous gap exists between the rich and the poor. Some don't know how to spend their money, while others can't find any money and are going through garbage for their food. Uh, some live in very fancy homes. Some live in very poor homes. And the stunning thing is that over that period, inequality has been rising everywhere, including China. Now, China has raised everybody. A huge amount of people were raised above the poverty line in China, an enormous ach achievement. But between the rural areas and the industrialized seaboard, the gap is growing inside China as well. But uh, So you can see every country, or, or almost all of these countries, have now been dealing with increased uh, inequality. So how do we measure inequality? Well, actually, there's the, the uh, Gini coefficient and the Lorentz curve. Uh, it started in 1905 when Lorentz was doing his PhD at the University of Wisconsin, and uh, he created a curve that would indicate the degree of inequality in a society. A few years later, in 1912, uh, Corrado Gini developed the Gini coefficient, which bears his name to this day. And inequality, according to the Gini scale, is measured between zero, where everybody is equal, and one, where all the country's uh, income is earned or controlled by one person. So this is a likely equation, but the main thing is that it's easily calculated uh, from even unordered size data as the sum of differences, pairwise differences. You can look at that. Now, here is the Lorentz curve. On the bottom line, you have the increase in number of households from zero to 100%. And the red line represents the Lorentz curve, which is the accumulation of how much wealth they have until they reach 100%. And uh, clearly, the blue line is the line of equality. If everybody gets exactly the same, then as you add more, you would go straight through on that 45-degree line. But in fact, you never have that. And therefore, you end up with the Lorentz curve. And the Gini coefficient is really the area A divided by A plus B. So you can see that more inequality and so on. And uh, the value of that is that it allows us to look at numbers and compare across countries, regardless of their income level, the degree of inequalities that they have. So uh, you look here, you find, for example, Namibia at 70% and Japan at 25%. So that kind of shows you what societies are like. More importantly, if you track it over time, you can see a trend. This is the United States, where very briefly in the 1960s, you had the war on poverty, you had the Civil Rights Act, you had many things that occurred. And you can actually see inequality comes down, and then it picks up again and keeps going up and up and up. And you can compare time across countries and so on. And that people found very good. Now, mathematically, I don't know whether you want to spend some time on that, but I'll run very quickly. Uh, it has certain qualities which we value in statistics, uh, mean independence, population size independence, symmetry, and pigou dalton transfer sensitivity, but it does not have decomposability or statistical testability. Although that we can do better now, we have much better data, but fundamentally uh, decomposability is not there. In other words, if you were to take the Gini for each of the regions in Brazil and uh, you add them up, they don't equal the Gini for all of Brazil. Interestingly enough, the P-alpha coefficients uh, do. They, they have the composability as well. Then there are other new things, uh, Thiles, Entropy, Atkinson's Generalized Measures, etc. Kakwani and others have worked on other things, but the thoughtful use of multiple indicators will lead to richer and more nuanced policy than simply relying on one indicator such or one number, no matter how good that number is or is not. And the MPI, the Multidimensional Poverty Index, uh, which is used by Oxford, by UNDP, by others, brings together three dimensions of poverty, health, education, and living standards, and 10 indicators that we can use to construct these estimates. 
And remember, that is the one that showed that the poor were 85%, not 70% in rural areas. So others, like IFAD, have done got a lot of work on understanding the, the uh, poverty, and the rural poverty in particular, and it's a very complicated thing because once you have a lot of numbers, then you have difficulty assessing, well, this one is doing better, this one is doing worse. Uh, what are we doing in the aggregate? And if you add them, then you have to ask yourself about weights. And how do you weight them? So there's a technical problem that arises when you start to use multiple things. Item nine of the empath is resilience. We'll come back to that in a moment, but let's look at extreme poverty and hunger. Okay. Uh, the situation gets worse in drought and conflict, but without anything else, extreme poverty is associated with hunger. Uh, I think Amatya Sen showed that you could have famine even when there, are, there is production in the country because the poorest cannot afford access. And defining that is terrible, and I go by uh, my late boss and friend, later on friend at the time when I was so sorry, he was president of the bank at the time, Bob McNamara, who in 1973 said, it is a condition of deprivation that falls below any rational definition of human decency. Extreme poverty, it should not be accepted by anybody. Now the UN says we have cut it in half, come on, because we, at least one in eight people remain hungry. Now one in eight people is almost a billion people, as you know. So Nigeria in Africa is becoming, it's growing very much in population, but for the first time it displaced, last year, it displaced India as the country with the largest number of people in extreme poverty. Uh, that's actually 86 million of its inhabitants. And India had 79 million of its inhabitants. So India that always was the biggest repository of very poor, extreme poor people, hungry people, actually is no longer that, it's now Nigeria. This is stunning because we know the big problems are going to be partly in Asia, but obvious example, India is doing better, but in Africa where things are going to be much worse. So uh, the MDGs set the target of reducing it and the SDGs wants to abolish it by 2030 abolish extreme poverty. And uh, we still talk of people living a dollar a day, although as I said, it's now $2.12 uh, in 2019, based on uh, an updating of the calculations that were initiated in 1996 with a dollar a day. But the amazing thing, of course, is that, you know, we have all these errors all the time. As scientists, we should not accept this. For example, clearly if I'm talking about dollar a day or variance of it, the exchange rate of the dollar to other currencies that goes up and down should affect how we apply that measure to other countries. So we just say it'll even out over time, but that's not very good. The conditions though, you know, it's like uh, the justice of the Supreme Court who had to deal about pornography, and he said, I cannot define it precisely, but I recognize it when I see it. And I think nobody can see pictures like these and say, well, are you sure they are below the 27% line, or are they maybe above it? No, I mean, look, this, this is just terrible. Extreme poverty is really a condition beneath any definition of human decency. Just look at that. Look at the dogs and the people sleeping on the pavements, child labor, and hunger, hundreds of millions. I'm not gonna say a billion or a billion more, or more than a billion, just hundreds of millions of people are in that condition. And hunger has to be abolished. There are many, many studies, so, and some of them in fact pay good attention to gender dimensions of this, but in the end, it is something beneath any definition of human decency and must be abolished. Now, the sad thing that I have to tell you now is, as if that wasn't enough, 
we are about to face a whole series of shocks. And uh, climate change is coming. You all know about climate change. It's very complicated, many interactions from the atmospheric level to the deep oceans, etc., etc. And uh, however, variability in rainfall and temperature is expected according to climate models. And hurricanes, floods, and droughts, and heat, and forest fires are coming. Uh, this, I like this, this uh, comes from National Geographic. This is the number of hurricane tracks in the 10 years, 85, 95. This is 95, 2005. This is 2005, 2015. And you'd think that even somebody who doesn't know how to count very much could see very clearly <laughs> that the risks are increasing and devastating. The forest fires we've had in California and in south Southwest Europe are reminders of other things that go on, plus sea level rise, storm surges, etc., going on as the floodplain comes in, in small amounts, it's true, but low onset disasters is no less a disaster. And that's a topic for another lecture, not here. Erratic rainfall and desertification is. Now, if you look at Africa, where the bulk of the poor are now, the extreme poor are going to be located, the population is growing very rapidly, and at the same time, 95% of agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa is rain-fed. And thus, there's very little irrigation. And as a result, the variability of cycles of rainfall, which leads to floods, and then cycles of, uh, of drought, which leads to famine, is going to be devastating. This is Khartoum. And uh, the 95% of the agriculture is smallholder, and we have to deal with that. And pastoralists who live at the edge of the Sahara live in a very precarious existence. Rainfall varies very widely over Africa, and in fact, uh, it increases with climate change, and these shows some of the places where we'll have droughts and floods. Well, how about underground water? Well, actually, we've been pumping it wherever we could, at a devastating result, which leads to a falling water table. And this is a well, actually, in Niger. And you can see the steps as the water table goes down, further, further, further down, until barely a few drops are available. And then, of course, after that, you have desertification, and then the loss of topsoil and what goes with it. And that is pushing people who were at the borderline back into poverty extreme poverty and hunger. Uh, this is in South Asia. That's the need for water. The water shortage is everywhere. Uh, crops dying out, cattle dying out, and desertification. And here's a well. Look at the splotch of water at the bottom of the well. And look at one well and all these people trying to get some water around it while in another part of India, there's a flood going on. And uh, floods and desertification and droughts are going to go back and forth. On top of that, we have conflicts. I mean, as if it wasn't bad enough to deal with that. No, we have conflicts. And uh, some of the conflicts are a result of the stresses. Remember Darfur. Darfur was uh, in, the, in the west of northern Sudan, was the movement of tribes onto the lands of other tribes because they had lost water and they took over their land and the others defended their land and so on. So we've had a lot of that. And conflict is pervasive in many parts of Africa and Asia. And this uh, is showing the number of people displaced, newly displaced in 2013, with the exception of Colombia, which is in Latin America. Everything else is uh, Africa, Asia, Middle East. And the amount of destruction is enormous. This is Syria, this is Africa, African wars, and displacement of people as the tanks roll by, the columns of refugees go by, and they have nothing. 65.6 million forcibly displaced worldwide. Biggest number since World War II. Assessing the challenge, therefore, we have to look at the projected enormous growth of Africa, which is the first line, under the total, that goes from 1.1 billion to 4.4 billion, a quadrupling of the population in one lifetime. That's amazing. Now, some say, no, this is too large. 
their calculations are about a trebling. Okay, well, even to add 2.2 billion, billion human beings to Africa, which has all these problems right now, is a very serious issue. So how do we deal with that? Well, there's also urbanization, there's a the smallholder farmer, and the single key to everything is to lower the cost of food. Now, lower the cost of food because it goes directly into the pocket of the poorest people. Poorest people, whether in urban areas or in many rural areas, pay the largest part of their revenue to food. And if you lower the price of food, no administration, no government bureaucrats, it goes directly to them. But what do you do about the poor farmer who produces it? Well, you have to increase the production faster than the price drops. And that's what happened in the famous Green Revolution in India, where you can see the rice price dropping down and the production of rice going up. And that's what happened to smallholder farmers, and therefore they get off better and so on. But we need more food, 40% by 2030, 70% by 2050, more production. And that will mean we have to focus on the smallholder farmer. Why? Well, I will tell you we have to increase yields under cultivation or increase yields. Uh, land under cultivation cannot be increased. This is so stunning that you can't see it. You can't see, actually, Asia and Africa. Here they are. See those two little blue dots? One says 2.2 and says 1.0. That's the average farm size in hectares in Asia and Africa. So you can see that this is devastating. I mean, when you see the averages in North and Central America, it's 117, South America 74, Europe 12, and then we're down to less than 2.2 than and 1. So we have to really focus on the smallholder farmer and uh, the urbanization, uh, which is sometimes driven by economic boom or sometimes by desperation, will result in people trying to find food and it's pervasive urban poverty and it will not be a rich kind of variety that we were hoping to see in urbanization with vertical agriculture and gardens and so on. In fact, one of the obstacles, which I haven't talked about at all, is the, the infrastructure. Because as the continent urbanizes, it will need more storability, more transportability, more processing and retailing. But the condition of the infrastructure will be a major obstacle, very major obstacle. So what can science do? Well, the Green Revolution had a huge impact but it bypassed Africa. So we need to go jump ahead with more genetically diverse crops, with uh, less use of pesticides, integrated pest management, working with nature, integrated soil, water, and nutrient management, recognizing the gender dimension, promoting alternatives to slash and burn, reduce post-harvest losses between 35 and 60% of uh, production is lost between the farm and the consumer and increase the nutrition of the food that they eat. So to choose priorities, the three priorities that Swaminathan and I agreed on back at the CGIR days, pro-poor, pro-women, pro-environment. Whatever meets those three criteria, we should do. And we should bring in the genetic imperative of the new science that goes there and focus on the problems of the poor. And yes, we can have upland rice that is deep-rooted and uh, everything else that we would like to see. But we should also pursue future technologies. And we can transform agriculture by really thinking in terms of jumping ahead, leapfrogging, and having these poorest countries actually use precision agriculture. Now, that would be a better use of land, water, other energy inputs, and labor. Just as a reminder, this is a stunning statistic. People may need two liters a day, maybe, to drink water like that, like I'm drinking here. Or they may need some more to cook, some more to bathe. But fundamentally, they actually need around 2,400 liters. Because on average, it takes a liter of water to produce one calorie of food. So this is stunning. So we need more crop per drop, as the late David Seckler would say. We also have barely started to understand the biotic basis of soil fertility. We've been treating soil fertility exclusively as chemistry. 
you add the potassium, nitrates, etc. But, but the, the biological side of it has been escaping us. And we have precision agriculture, many things. Better management, yes, we can do that. SRI, other systems of that kind. Better management of uh, the distance between, or the, the, the shift from uh, uh, lab to farm and farm to consumer. And then today's robots already can do a lot of that. And uh, look, they can even pick an individual uh, uh, strawberry. They can see, recognize, and feel whether it's ripe or not and the other vegetables and so on. But in Africa, we would think of smaller robots that can do a lot with great precision, but don't have necessarily uh, the values of other things. Now, uh, remote sensing and mobile phones, we can use mobile phones, which have been used after all. M-Pesa in East Africa is a banking system that works with uh, mobile phones. So we can go to mobile phones would penetrate the markets and we can get the data down and download it and pass it on to the farmers. And with satellites, you get a pixel of about 10 meters by 10 meters, but with drones, you get 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters. Now that's like an individual plant. And it can tell you an individual plant hungry or, or wet or whatever. There's a lot of applications going on. And uh, drones are now cheaper and cheaper. And uh, so imagery is now going to be there. Agriculture will make good use of the new biology on one side and the ICT on the other. And we can even do spectral analysis for conditions of soil, conditions of water. This is damage caused by flooding and water content of field. We can manage all of that and find time series data even over it. And we need agricultural extension staff to be in, uh, multiplied many times, trained and intensified. Now, early biotechnology relied on uh, inserting extra extraneous genes using agrobacterium. And uh, people were saying, are you playing God? And I said, why? And I said, because you're changing the natural order of things. And I said, okay, yeah, I am playing God, and so are you. Every time nighttime comes, you turn on the lights. God tells you that's the end of the day, now is the time for you to be in the dark. You say, nope, I'm gonna turn on the lights. So if you do this every day, why is it that when we come to biology, you suddenly tell me, oh my God, this is playing. God, you know, you're changing the order of things. And yes, I am changing the order of things for the better. And we know the experience of that has been found. The original work with the agrobacterium timofensis was done by Joseph Schell and Mark von Montague, and they are used for, for, uh, by, by Ingo Potricus and uh, Ron Bayer for golden rice and other things of that night. But the main thing here is that they talked about nutrition, and that's important. Now, the new genome editing techniques, the famous CRISPRs, CRISPR-Cas9 being most common, but there's CRISPR-12, Cas12, Cas13, etc., uh, are going to be much faster, much cheaper, and will allow us to transform for traits that we need, such as drought tolerance, salt tolerance, shorter growing period, etc which uh, most of the co co uh, commercial companies do not actually uh, work on. And uh, also on human beings, and I had the great privilege of being part of the committee that drafted this for the National Academy of Sciences and National Academy of Medicine on science, ethics, and governance. And here we did not want people to apply this to human beings, especially not germline, until we know more, but in 2018, Professor He Kiang offered in Hong Kong the two babies who are the first human beings who have been uh, edited. But I must say I was pleased that not only uh, people reminded of our report, but more importantly, the government, the government of the, uh, China released a statement saying that he had crossed the lines and this is not acceptable. So at least we are trying to give some guidance at the same time, we are on the cusp of many, many new breakthroughs. Now back to agriculture, we can apply this very easily. And the future, therefore, uh, is a combination of biological and ICT technology that will dramatically transform things. Just dream for a moment. Dream, lab-produced meat, single-cell proteins, aquaculture, algae-based fuels, uh, new approaches to uh, enriching soil fertility. And all of that done with uh, science, technology, and innovation and uh, which keeps driving the engine on the ICT side and on the biology side, 
but without the application for the poorest of the poor, which we want to reach. So in general, we should do what has worked well so that the best practices of the few become the general practices of the many, uh, such as soil conservation, no-till agriculture, better management of uh, aquatic resources. And here you can see that uh, uh, we used to have a very small amount of fish farming, but the blue has become horizontal, that's catch, and the green is the fish farming, and it's increasing very rapidly. And this is now working with all the other SDGs. So although I believe that uh, uh, the layer model that I'm going to show you as my last thing is applicable, uh, it has been done in, in Wageningen. I was a professor in Wageningen a long time ago on resilience. If we know that people are poor and we know that the shocks are coming, what can we do to cope with that? Well, uh, in this case, we looked at deltas, 10 deltas that are likely to be affected by saltwater intrusion, by other things. And uh, we said there are three layers. Uh, the bottom one is uh, natural systems. The middle one is the network layer, that's roads, dams, uh, etc. And the top one is an occupational layer, which is what uh, people do, whether buildings, shops, etc. And then you design something and you go ahead, but once you start having a response, you must go back and evaluate it again and constantly monitor and uh, amend what you're doing. So every question is linked to a host of other issues. And that's the research agenda that I'd like to give you. So if you look at the drivers of change in this little diagram I've given you, it is, these are how they're affected. And for each one of these to be able to make reasonable statements, you need to study all of these other points. If you look at research need on these divers themselves, there are additional data gathering, additional modeling, additional work to be done. If you look at these as you go down to the others from occupation, so pressure on land and water use, many feed in and more feed into that. Networks, here we are, and again more and the base layer, and again more. It's a huge research agenda ahead of us to have a sensible way of dealing with this. Now this, mind you, we did that in the Netherlands. The Netherlands have one third of the country below sea level. It's the only country that has done that very successfully, the polders and so on. So we need to, to, to help with all of this. Conclusions, therefore, from the design of evidence-based regulations to proper assessment of how policies and programs are working, science is essential. And for dealing with poverty, we must reach the smallholder farmers, especially in Africa and Asia, and bring a doubly green revolution and use science to transform agriculture. And hence, I will come back now, revisiting past recommendations. Uh, we were just talking with the Mademoiselle from the INRA, that uh, I've been saying this for the last 30 years, <laughs> but it uh, doesn't matter. Uh, now the challenges are grown bigger, but the science has become much more powerful. For what science can do for poverty and inequality is to transform global agriculture because to reach out to the smallholder farmers. My 10 commandments are the same that Muhammad Hassan may remember, which I mentioned in Brazil here like about 10 years ago. And they are still the same. First of these, reform policies and markets. Globally, you need fair trade, not tariffs like Mr. Trump is doing, but a fair trade system. And locally, you need to remove the urban bias on education health against the rural areas. Focus on the smallholders. Yes, we know about all that. Husband natural resources. Yes, we know all about that. But one of the most important environmental actions is to reduce the need for more land under cultivation because it will preserve habitats and biodiversity. Raise agricultural productivity, we talked about that, and, but please measure in terms of total factor productivity. You, you talk to people, they still say, what's the yield? Oh, so many tons per hectare. No, per cubic meter of water, per unit of energy, per unit of labor. That has to be seen in this term. Remember that it is the production that has to go up while the prices go down in order to enable people to find the food they need and address short-term variability. That's what we were talking about, creating resilience. 
And here is something that we talked about also, which was to improve the nutritional content because it doesn't appear that much. Uh, we talked about golden rice, but these are the, the uh, sweet potatoes with and without beta-carotene. And this is one of my favorite diagrams. Believe it or not, this is a diagram. These two pigs are twins. One was fed regular maize and one was fed quality protein maize. I rest my case, this is not, I don't have to tell you about lysine content, I don't have to tell you graphs about it. You can see for yourself what quality protein maize is. And this is sometimes difficult to sell to people because they look the same. Why should I pay more for this rather than this maize? Well, because of the nutritional content that will give you more productive lives. Short-term vulnerability, we talked about floods and droughts, but we did not talk about locusts. This year there was an attack of locusts. That's another devastating problem for people. Empower women, yes, we know all about that. We talked about it many times. Reach out to the ultra poor because they need special outreach. They can't trickle down. Trickle down does not work. Lord Keynes said a very nasty thing, but I will repeat it. He said, trickle down is to say, keep feeding the horse a lot of oats, and some of it will pass onto the street for the minnows. <laughs> that was his view. So landless farm workers or the refugees and those who move. Support science, yes. Remember, this was the Inter-Academy Council and the Inter-Academy Partnership. We presented that. Translate rhetoric into action. Uh, rhetoric declaration plans are not equal to real action. And this is a stunning statement from the late President Kennedy. 1963, 1963, we have the capacity to eliminate hunger from the face of the earth. In our lifetime, we need only the will. And my friends are peer of South Africa, the African Union, and so you have translators of English into Swahili, English into Arabic, French into, but we're still missing a translator for rhetoric into action. And I think that's very telling. So with all these, there's so much that science can do for a whole generation and for the whole world. And I thank you. Thank you, Ismail, for a very exciting talk. In fact, uh, you know, we are always worried about having an agenda concerning the topic of this conference, the theme of this conference, and you are, you are offering us a very nice agenda and showing what science can do for poverty. Uh, I'm quite sure that many people would like to have questions and discussions, but uh, uh, I think we will have time during this uh, uh, conference to... Uh, go back to these points and ask questions and make comments. So uh, I propose that we go to the next session. Uh, I just want to raise you know, some questions to, to think about, maybe, uh, but we can discuss about this later. It's quite evident that science can do good things for poverty. Now, does this, will these technological developments help to decrease inequality or to increase it? because of the different access to the uh, technological developments. I think it's a big question for all of us. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Okay. Yes. So, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Okay, so let, let's move to the first session of this morning that will be coordinated um, by Professor Elisa Hayes. And the session will be on poverty as a multidimensional problem. Okay, I call the participants of that section.
Okay, so hello again, here I am. <laughs> well, this section is, is about to restore the gender balance from the previous one. But we have a third, part, a fourth participant who will be here very soon. Okay, it's a great pleasure to start this section, especially because the keynote speaker gave us a fantastic illustration of the multidimensionality of poverty, which is the title of this, this section. Yes, poverty is a very complicated issue. It involves a lot of things. That's why we need the collaboration of all the sciences. And we finally, I mean, I think we are getting closer and closer to the, reali to the realis realization that transdisciplinarity is absolutely necessary. I mean, the way to put science and technology to serve society is actually to make science talk among themselves. But of course, that's not all. As our keynote speaker noticed, we need action. For action, we need very good interaction between science and policy makers. And for action, we also need very good dialogue between science and society at large. I mean, that's the three key components, science, policy, and action. Uh, I won't take too, too much time because I want to give the speakers a lot of, a lot of time. Uh, I will, we will have the three presentations, 20 minutes each, followed by open discussion. Following the order in the program, Maria Emma Santos from the CONICET and from the Oxford Poverty Human Development Initiative will start followed by Paulo Bus from the, from the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation, director of the Center for Global Health. And finally, we have Alison Loconto from the Institute of Nation, National Institute of Ag Agronomic Research. Uh, it's very happy that we start with Emma, who will talk about the multidimensionality in itself. And then we focus on two of the many dimensions of poverty, health and uh, food. With that, I give the floor to Maria Emma Santos. Good morning. <clears throat> Is my presentation ready? Well, it's an honor for me to be here. Um, thank you very much um, to the organizers. My name is Maria Emma Santos. I come from Argentina, from Universidad Nacional del Sur and CONICET, but also on behalf of the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative. And um, this morning, I would like to present you with some of the key findings of the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index, some of which uh, Professor Sarah Gelding has already advanced in uh, the previous fantastic lecture we have just heard. So, ah. shall, shall I move with this one? Okay, so as you know, SDG 1.2 is about reducing at least by half the proportion of men, women, and children of all ages living in poverty in all its dimensions according to national definitions. Our humble understanding is that the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index um, offers what we think is probably the most detailed picture to date of the world's poorest people. This index was developed in 2010 in a joint work between UNDP and OFI for the flagship report of the 20th anniversary of the Human Development Report. And since then, it has been updated annually to include newly released data set. In last year, in 2018, OFI and UNDP undertook a joint revision of the global MPI and five of its 10 indicators were improved, adjusted, um, so that the MPI better aligns with the SDGs. 
The results I'm going to share with you cover over 100 countries, 105. They have been disaggregated over 1,000 subnational regions by uh, urban and rural areas and by age group. And the MPI is, we think, useful in identifying people who are being left behind in multiple SDGs. So, as it was mentioned previously, the MPI covers three dimensions, just as the HDI, health, education, and living standards, and 10 indicators, nutrition, child mortality, years of schooling, school attendance, cooking fuel, sanitation, drinking water, electricity, housing, and assets. But it's not just an aggregation of macro indicators. It looks into each household, whether each household suffers simultaneous deprivations. So I'm going to get more into the detail, but all these indicators have clear connections with several SDGs. How are these weighted? Well, each dimension weights the same, a third, and each indicator within each dimension weights the same. So that means that the education and health indicators weight with one sex, and the living standards indicator weight with one over 18. When is a household, when is a person considered to be multidimensionally poor? When he or she lives in a household that experiences a third or more of the weighted, indica of the weighted indicators. That means being deprived in one full dimension or its, its equivalent or more. But we also look at those who are vulnerable, as we define them as vulnerable, which are those who experience between 20% and 33% of the weighted deprivations. And within the MPI poor, we also look into a subgroup, which we can call them the severely poor, which are those who are deprived in a half of more or more of the weighted indicators. How is the MPI computed? <clears throat> it sort of mimics the poverty gap in terms of income, in, terms, in the sense that it combines two sub-indices, incidence and intensity. So it is the proportion of people who have been identified as poor times the average deprivation share the poor experience. And so when someone becomes deprived in one further dimension, the MPI goes up and the other way around. Um, the MPI is computed using primarily the demographic and health surveys and the multiple indicator cluster surveys, but for certain countries, some specific surveys are used either because those are not available or lack some key indicator or there are some other problems. For example, for Brazil, the uh, Pesquisa Nacional for Amostra, the Amostra de Domicilios is used. Overall, most data sets are from the year 2010 to the year 2016, and a big part from 2014 to 2016. There are only a few that are a bit older, from 2006. I know. So let me share with you the first finding, um, which is that uh, in the last session, um, professor, the professor was saying that we still don't agree of uh, one number. Uh, about how many people are poor. Well, we understand that 1.3 billion people are MPI poor, which is about 23% of the population covered by these estimates. And 46% of that 1.3 billion people, people are in severe poverty, meaning that they experience 50% or more of these weighted deprivations. This table shows how are they poor. So these are people who have been identified as multiply deprived, deprived in a third or more, and those percentages are the percentages of the MPI poor who experience, who live in households that experience this deprivation. So we see that 91% of the MPI poor cook with wood, dung, charcoal, or coal with the health risk that we know that entails, inhaling indoor polluted air. 80% live in a house with a dirt floor or walls or roof made of rudimentary materials. Again, that is no safe home for climatic conditions for violence. About the same percentage, 
four in five do not have an adequately um, hygienic toilet, according to SDG guidelines, or this is shared, it's a shared toilet. 62% uh, live in a household where someone, at least someone up to 70 years of age, is nutritionally deprived. Um, we include stunting, we include underweight for children up to five, and then BMI for age, and then for adults, BMI. So for those households, just mere survival is not guaranteed, and we know this is particularly worrying for children because it shapes their future life chances. 56% of the MPI poor and one in 10 uh, persons in the world um, cannot light a bulb or a fan or a heater. And we are not talking about quality surveys, power cuts, and that sort of more refined measurement. Half of the MPI poor live in a household where no one has completed six years of schooling. And we know what an obstacle that is to building social networks, finding a decent job, understanding forums, filling forums, surfing into the internet, and so on. 45% of the MPI poor don't have um, access to safe drinking water, so they are exposed to borderline diseases and infections. 44% don't have basic assets. We are talking about having at least two of radio, TV, um, refrigerator, motorbike, bicycle, computer, or animal cart, or a car or truck. Those assets help, I mean, enhance well-being, but also, um, in many cases, they allow economic activity and can also act as an insurance against shocks. And then 37% of the MPI poor live in a household where at least a child is not attending school, so the MDG of universal primary education is not yet achieved. Uh, and the lowest number is child mortality, which means that 13% um, of the MPI poor live in a household where at least, uh, uh, at least a child has died in the five years preceding the survey. Still, given the tragedy that child mortality is, it's still quite an appalling statistic. So where do the MPI poor live? Well, surprisingly, two-thirds live in middle-income countries. So, as we were saying, uh, as, as the professor was saying in the previous lecture, a uh, high or an acceptable GNI per capita does not guarantee not being in multidimensional poverty. Of course, still, low-income countries have higher shares of uh, MPI poor, but, but uh, this is still an, uh, an important result. Where do the MPI poor live? Well, most of them, 83%, live in South Asian Sub-Saharan Africa. Latin America is only home to 3% of the MPI poor. Uh, but those are 40 million. 40 million people in Latin America are MPI poor. This graph plots the two sub-indices of the MPI incidence, the green one and the pink one, is intensity of poverty. So it's Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Arab states, and then come Latin America, with 8% of the population in MPI poverty. But it's interesting to note that intensity is still quite high. So among those who are MPI poor, they are poor in many things at the same time. Where in Latin America do they live? Well, Brazil and Mexico, naturally, because they are the bigger, biggest countries, um, are home to important fractions of the MPI poor, but Haiti, which is a small country, is also home to a significant fraction of the MPI poor. Guatemala, Peru, Colombia, Bolivia, Honduras, Nicaragua. In South Asia, it's India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, in Africa is Nigeria, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Tanzania. Um, this is the ranking of the Latin American countries by MPI poverty. Again, Brazil is not the best, it's just the least poor country, but because it's such a huge country, it's still home of many poor people. Haiti is the poorest, and by far it's almost an outlier in the region. Um, as we were seeing in the previous lecture, 85% of the MPI poor live in rural areas. And that points to a starkest inequality between urban and rural areas, which is particularly pronounced in Latin America. 
Only 25% of the population in Latin America live in rural areas, and yet 68% of the MPI poor live in rural areas in Latin America. So it's one of the, it's the region with the biggest disparity in terms of uh, geographic distribution. Another specificity of the case of Latin America is that although we do not have such an important fraction of people in severe multidimensional poverty, we do have a similar amount of people in um, multidimensional poverty who are vulnerable. So 40 million people are MPI poor and 40 million people are vulnerable to MPI poverty. They experience 20 to 33% uh, of um, weighted deprivations. And 2% are in severe poverty. In other regions such as South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, the proportion of people in severe poverty is much higher. And the other important finding is that half of the MPI poor are children. Half of the MPI poor are children and a third of the children in the world are MPI poor. And their intensity is much higher than amongst adults. And 18% of the children are in severe poverty. Most of poor children live in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. But it, again, 62% um, of the poor children still live in middle-income countries. A good news, however, is that India, which is a country that has lifted over 200 million people out of multidimensional poverty, the youngest group, the, the, the children, has been the group that, um, uh, that has improved the most. And also the poorest states have improved the most. So that is a message of hope. Um, the MPI has been computed for countries, but as I said, also for subnational regions. I'm not going to get into this detail, but one, when one computes for subnational regions, one sees a lot of heterogeneity that is obscured by the national number. And so one may see huge discrepancies within countries. Again, uh, we can also decompose by indicators, and so you can see the different shapes of poverty across the world. So, Tajikistan and Peru are two countries that have similar MPI values. But yet, in Tajikistan, the contribution of years of schooling is less than 1%, whereas in Peru, it's much higher. And the opposite is uh, true for the case of the contribution of nutritional issues. This is the comparison between MPI poverty and 190 a day poverty. Obviously, because the overall number is bigger, what we see is that the point, the dot, is the headcount ratio of 190 a day poverty and the um, length of the bar is the incidence of MPI poverty. The darkest is severe poverty and the overall is overall MPI poverty. In most countries, obviously, the incidence of MPI poverty is higher than the uh, incidence of $1.90 a day, but there are some countries for which that um, ways the other, works the other way around, or they are similar, such as in the case of Brazil. And let me share with you one very simple result of growth and multidimensional poverty. We estimated a, a model of following Ravalian and Chen, which is the first difference estimator model that looks into the change of the MPI against economic growth, and the beta is the elasticity. We did it with what we had, which was a panel, which was a panel of 78 countries with two or more MPI observations in time. And what we found was a very small elasticity of 0 0.56. So, a 1% increase in the average growth rate leads only to a reduction of 0.56% in the MPI. It's a bit higher for incidence of multidimensional poverty. Recall that MPI is incidence adjusted by intensity. And it is a bit higher for income poverty. Well, it's quite higher for income poverty, I must say. But that just tells us Again, that the trickle-down theory doesn't work and that growth does not reach to non-monetary uh, deprivations. Um, just a quick example, Colombia has uh, built um, 
uh, a national MPI, because obviously the global MPI, as any global poverty measure, is limited. Um, it, it lacks some indicators. It, it could be more comprehensive. It, meets, it only measures acute poverty, not moderate poverty. So countries may want to look into their own relevant measures. And Colombia has used its MPI for a lot of things um, related to policy not only to monitor poverty and quantify, but also to encourage is to touch institutional coordination across the different ministries, um, to track behavior of different poverty dimensions, to prioritize certain municipalities and certain interventions, and so on. And let me share with you uh, recommendation 19 of the Atkinson report in 2016, uh, commission led by Tony Atkinson, and, uh, and which was formed by a, a big uh, group of important scholars, experts in poverty. Um, they produced a fascinating report with a lot of recommendations. Half or more than half of it is devoted to the measurement of income and consumption poverty, and the other is devoted to the complementary indicators. And recommendation 19 is that amongst the complementary indicators, there should be a multidimensional a multidimensional poverty indicator based on the counting approach using this uh, methodology. They also suggested a number of dimensions to consider, six of them, nutrition, health status, education, housing conditions, access to work and personal security, of which the MPI covers four, the other two cannot be covered in uh, an index with this country coverage because simply data is not, is not good or is not available. Um, so at the moment, I, I, I would say that too important, um, some of the global poverty measures are the dollar 90 a day and the global MPI, and they are complementary. Both provide very useful information. Um, last year, the World Bank report on poverty and shared prosperity included uh, an index, a multidimensional poverty measure, in an attempt to extend the dollar ninety a day to have a broader perspective. Uh, but just, I thought it was important to clarify that because they included income indica in the indicator and they had to use for that uh, LSMS kind of surveys, they were unable to include the health dimension, nutrition and child mortality, and they didn't include, include cooking fuel and housing and assets. So it is a multidimensional measure, but it's more restricted. And not surprisingly, they find a lower um, proportion of people in multidimensional poverty as the health dimension is missing. Um, and so all in all, they are covering three-ish of the dimensions suggested by the, by the Atkinson report. Um, but just to conclude, we have lots of challenges ahead. I think I don't need to clarify that. There are still many data challenges in terms of advance of, on further international consensus and minimum standards for certain indicators, say materials of roof and walls. Still, there is still a lot of empty places, overcrowding, many indicators still um, need uh, more consensus. Collect harmonized data, even on water and sanitation, there are huge, uh, sometimes it becomes really complicated to harmonize the data. Um, and then a, a key a question is whether one day would it be possible to have in an integrated survey information on nutrition and health good quality information and good quality information on consumption or income at least. But probably bigger than those challenges are the policy challenges, uh, which as I was um, just showing with one small number, growth does not guarantee reduction of multidimensional poverty. We need to look for which are the kinds of proper growth and certainly accompany, accompany that by very specific and interconnected policies that try to address the different dimensions in an interlinked way. Well, that's all for, from my side. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you very much, Emma, for, for helping us to map out the complexity of the multidimensionality poverty involves. And I now ask Dr. Paulo Bus to give his presentation, and I go back down to see what he has to show. Bom dia a todos e a todas. Vou falar em português, <coughs> português rouco. Não é um português como eu gostaria, porque é um resfriado me pegou nesse final de semana. É, e o meu tema será uma das dimensões que eu considero mais importantes da relação da pobreza e da desigualdade com o tema da saúde. Primeiro, ressaltando a importância, obviamente, que para cada indivíduo e para uma comunidade, para uma população, tem o campo da saúde. Quer dizer, uma população saudável gerará uma sociedade com melhores condições de desenvolvimento e a vida de uma pessoa, igualmente, será, evidentemente, muito mais feliz se for uma vida com saúde. E é, eu estou falando isso tudo, mas não estou sabendo mexer nesse... nesse. Ah, eu queria começar homenageando duas personalidades que eu aprecio muito. A primeira delas é Edwin Chadwick, que foi o primeiro uh, diretor de saúde pública uh, inglês na Revolução Industrial, ao redor de 1850, e Chadwick, sinteticamente, no seu ah, estudo sobre as condições sanitárias da população trabalhadora, ele que foi responsável pela reforma da lei dos pobres inglesa no período da Revolução Industrial, ele ah, dizia, em última análise, não sei se são pobres porque doentes ou se são doentes porque são pobres. E essa questão ela está presente até hoje. O quanto a pobreza gera mais condições de saúde e, ao mesmo tempo, mais condições de saúde necessariamente vão uh, tornar a população, vão, vão, digamos, é, proporcionar populações e indivíduos, famílias mais pobres. E a outra frase que é do brasileiro Caetano Veloso que diz, gente, é para brilhar, não para morrer de fome. Então, essas duas frases ditas, uh, muitos anos... Uh, epa. Não, eu já estou fazendo tudo errado aqui. Eu tenho que voltar e está indo, não sei como é que eu vou fazer. Ah, não, o que, que é isso? Para que lado vai isso aqui? Deixa eu ver... E eu já apresentei quase tudo, né? Quem é que me ajuda aqui? É, é, tem um. Eu tenho que apertar. Para trás eu quero ir. Ah, isso aí está indo para trás. Está indo para trás. É. é nesse debate de baixo. Então, vamos ver. Poxa, eu já dei todas as dicas. Né? Bem, é, com essa distância no tempo é que a gente vê o quanto, em 130 anos de distância, né, são percepções muito similares. Chadwick apontava para essa inequívoca relação viciosa entre pobreza, doença, pobreza, e Caetano aponta para que cada indivíduo e a sociedade deve aspirar para si mesmo, isto é, viver uma vida digna, brilhar né, na sua breve vivência como ser uh, vivo, biológico e social, que eu acho muito importante essa dupla característica. Meu Deus do céu. Ah, o que eu vou trabalhar, vou dar dados para vocês, é de uma comissão pan-americana, ou uma comissão continental, 
sobre equidade e desigualdade no campo da saúde, organizada pela Organização Pan-Americana da Saúde, e que eu fiz parte com muito orgulho desse grupo, no qual, em última análise, nós procuramos demonstrar que, é um que a questão da pobreza e a questão da desigualdade e da má saúde são questões estruturais, não são questões casuais, não são questões naturais. Na realidade, são questões que têm a ver com a estrutura social, ou seja, o modelo de desenvolvimento capitalista que nós vivemos, ele gera uma sociedade inequitativa, ele gera exclusão social e ele é ecoagressivo. Essas três características são parte integrante do modelo de desenvolvimento capitalista que nós vivemos hoje. E com inúmeras críticas, sejam de forças de esquerda, sejam mesmo daqueles que pretendem reformar o capitalismo. Ou seja, nós temos uma crítica hoje ao desenvolvimento capitalista que vem de dentro do próprio sistema, assim como seria esperado, que vem, evidentemente, das forças progressistas. É, primeiro, eu queria fazer uma caracterização global, quer dizer, nós vivemos uma crise sistêmica e global que se inicia em 2007 e 2008 no circuito central da economia globalizada, quer dizer, nos Estados Unidos e nos países da Europa, e que crise é essa que vem se aprofundando desde então indiscutivelmente, quer dizer, as economias estão uh, permanentemente, uh, uh, avançam lentamente, e retornam à crise. Não é? Ou seja, uma crise de bancos privados levou a uma crise das dívidas soberanas dos Estados, ou seja, a privatização dos lucros quando nós tínhamos uma economia saudável dando lucro e socializa-se os prejuízos no momento em que ah, os recursos financeiros se tornam escassos devido exatamente pelo jogo ah, comercial, pelo jogo pela, pela grande jogatina do capital financeiro uh, internacional. Disso reduz, redundam políticas recessivas, redução de investimentos públicos e de orçamentos sociais, inclusive da saúde. E uh, nós temos isso resumido num livro que eu considero seminal sobre esse tema, que chama-se Austeridade Mata, ou Por que a Austeridade Mata, do Stuckler, David Stuckler, um sociólogo ou geógrafo inglês, mostrando exatamente que a reação à crise gerou uma série de políticas que vem gerando mais e mais problemas de natureza social, inclusive de saúde, que é o foco do livro dele. Com essa crise, nós temos um aumento das desigualdades pré-existentes, aquilo que Stiglitz, em 2011, chamava os malefícios do processo de globalização, que se a globalização é positiva, ela também é muito negativa, e Stiglitz não perdeu essa noção, apesar de ter sido economista-chefe do Banco Mundial, mas um prêmio Nobel que tem uma clareza muito grande sobre essas dimensões da economia política internacional. É uma crise de múltiplas dimensões, esse impacto da crise global se abate sobre todos os países, embora de formas diferentes, né? E a desigualdade socioeconômica mundial e entre os países é uma desigualdade crescente. Né? Nós temos uma concentração inédita da renda, muito bem demonstrada, muito bem mostrada pelo Thomas Piketty, no seu Capital no século XXI, já traduzido, inclusive, para o português. Além dessa concentração inédita da renda, nós temos uma amplificação da pobreza e do desemprego. O jornal O Globo de hoje mostra uma fila em zigue-zague em São Paulo de quase 15 mil pessoas procurando emprego num país que tem 12,9% da população, principalmente jovem, desempregada. Quer dizer, esses são dados que vão impactar poderosamente sobre a situação de saúde dessas pessoas e dessas famílias e da sociedade como um todo. Um comprometimento ambiental em escala planetária, pelo modo de produção e consumo, né, que gera duas coisas importantíssimas, poluição e mudanças climáticas, que as, os slides mostrados pelo professor 
das enchentes e das secas é uma expressão dessa mudança climática com importantíssimo impacto sobre a saúde, principalmente dos pobres, não é? e as consequências são profundas sobre países de renda baixa e estados frágeis, principalmente, inclusive a América Latina, e profundas consequências sobre saúde e os sistemas de saúde. Queria começar mostrando aqui algumas, alguns dados, e vou tomar a América Latina e não o Brasil ou o mundo, apenas porque nos situamos e, e o nosso estudo, nesse momento, vem se concentrando na região da América Latina. Primeiro, vejam, nesse slide, nesse quadro da esquerda, a relação entre o quintil superior e o quintil inferior de renda, ou seja, entre os 20% mais pobres e os 20% mais ricos, que no Canadá é uma diferença de 5%, enquanto no Haiti ultrapassa os 20%, ou em Honduras, ou Panamá, Suriname, quer dizer, quanto mais pobre o país, também maior a desigualdade medida pela relação de posse da renda entre o quintil superior e o quintil ah, inferior. Do outro lado, já mostrando relações com a saúde, a percentagem de crianças com retardo de crescimento por quintil de riqueza. Vários países à esquerda, e, se vocês observarem o gráfico, é uniforme. Quanto mais, é, quanto mais é, pobre, no quintil mais pobre, nós vamos ter o maior retardo de crescimento. E o retardo de crescimento é muito importante em saúde, mais importante que peso em crianças menores de 5 anos, porque ele significa um efeito mais de mais longo prazo da desnutrição. Né? Então, isso mostra essa, esse padrão de quanto mais pobre, mais retardo de crescimento do quintil mais, dos 20% mais pobre, e, obviamente, é, isso é uma gradação pelos cinco quintis que compõem, a, se distribui a população. Aqui nesse quadro ao lado é a taxa de mortalidade de menores de cinco anos, segundo a cobertura de programas de proteção social. Ou seja, nós tivemos essa crise global, que, ataca, que também alcança o Brasil, a América Latina, e com isso o que nós observamos é que os programas de proteção social para a população infantil se prejudicaram intensamente. E aqui nós temos uma visão muito clara da quanto mais, é, maior será a percentagem de é, é, pessoas cobertas, nós vamos ter a mortalidade menor. Quanto menor a proporção de pessoas cobertas por programas de proteção social, maior será a mortalidade dos menores de cinco anos. Do outro lado... É uma outra dimensão, já tentando sair só da dimensão da renda e mostrando o multidimensional da relação entre a pobreza e a saúde. Né? Em todas, assim, todos os países que estão ali, a taxa de mortalidade de menores de cinco anos sempre é maior, sempre indiscutivelmente maior, nas populações indígenas do que nas populações ditas brancas. Né? E, lamentavelmente, hoje eu recebo no meu, no meu, no meu celular <coughs> ah, que o Brasil pretende sair, teve um quiprocó na OIT, e o Brasil pretende abandonar ah, a, a Convenção 169, que é a, 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 na OIT a, a convenção que é, defende, digamos, é, que protege o trabalho para as populações indígenas. Ou seja, nós vamos, é, neste momento da nossa história, na contramão daquilo que seria a superação da desigualdade, daquilo que seria a busca da equidade, infelizmente, inclusive, na, na, na arena internacional. Isso é para mostrar a taxa de deficiências físicas ou mentais em população de 0 a 18 anos, por sexo, segundo identidade indígena e afrodescendente. E aqui nós vamos ver, eu estou sem apontador, de novo, que em todos os países nós temos sempre eh, taxas de deficiência física ou mental maior quanto 
é, menor é a renda das, do, dos indivíduos. Né? Ou melhor, neste caso, relacionado com indígenas e afrodescendentes que sempre têm as taxas de deficiência física ou mental mais elevadas. Do lado de lá, nós vamos ver a questão dos jovens que nem estudam e que também estão fora do mercado de trabalho, de novo, por sexo agora e por afrodescendência, mostrando que mulheres e afrodescendentes são populações que sofrem mais na nossa sociedade essa discriminação e essa situação negativa em relação à sua condição. Esse dado, de novo, é para mostrar as desigualdades dos países, mostrando que a mortalidade entre os menores de cinco anos é 2,2 vezes maior no quintil mais pobre do que no quintil mais rico. Do, praticamente duas vezes mais mulheres desnutridas entre os mais pobres do que entre os mais ricos. E crianças com atraso no crescimento, em 50 países estudados, 3,2 vezes mais crianças com atraso de crescimento uh, no, nos quintis mais uh, pobres do que nos quintis mais ricos. Do outro lado é o acesso a serviços de saúde, que são, afinal, serviços que são oferecidos à população para mitigar, reduzir ou eliminar os efeitos é, dessas situações sociais. Por exemplo, o uso de terapia de reidratação oral na, na desidratação é 1,3 vezes maior entre os mais ricos do que entre os mais pobres. As vacinas, 2,3 vezes o uso de atendimento pré-natal, 3,1 vezes. O uso de métodos modernos de é, anticoncepcional, 4,4 vezes. E, finalmente, o último, me ajudem lá, é, assistência capacitada ao parto, que é cinco Paulo, vezes... Paulo, desculpe-me, Paulo, você tem cinco minutos. Você tem cinco minutos ainda. Ah, já estou terminando. Uh, esses eh, outros slides, que são todos eles, digamos, expressão daquilo que eu vinha dizendo, se re eu posso resumi-los aqui, nós temos uma tripla carga de enfermidades, a combinação das doenças epidêmicas com as doenças não transmissíveis, com as violências e outras causas, e o envelhecimento da população. Isso é uma síntese da situação, digamos, latino-americana no campo da saúde, que a gente mostrou ali um pouquinho antes. E uh, uma outra crise paralela é a crise dos chamados medicamentos, vacinas e tecnologias para diagnóstico, que, em geral, são muito caros e quase inacessíveis aos países pobres e, certamente, aos pobres de todos os países. E aqui vem uma das características que eu queria chamar a atenção da contribuição da ciência para a superação da pobreza e da desigualdade, que é na descoberta de insumos em saúde, medicamento, vacina, soros, recursos para diagnóstico, entre outras inovações, que nós, no campo da saúde, podemos contribuir efetivamente. Síntese. Nós apresentamos dados sobre a magnitude da pobreza e das desigualdades estruturais na América Latina, mostrando uma América Latina com alta heterogeneidade. A pobreza e a desigualdade são situações distintas e que requerem políticas públicas também distintas. Pobreza é uma coisa, desigualdade é outra, e as políticas públicas são diferentes para sanar as duas situações. E tão importante quanto erradicar a pobreza, que é um dos objetivos, o primeiro objetivo da Agenda 2030, ou dos ODS, é promover a equidade ou e reduzir ou eliminar as desigualdades econômicas, sociais e ambientais. Isto é, não deixar ninguém para trás, que é a mensagem da Agenda 2030. E, para isso, não é a mão invisível do mercado, nem as empresas que trabalham visando o lucro obviamente tem um, um papel social, não será a mão invisível do mercado, mas sim 
políticas públicas é que são essenciais, imprescindíveis e indelegáveis para promover a equidade e enfrentar as desigualdades. Quer dizer, não consigo visualizar em nenhuma situação que simplesmente o funcionamento, entre aspas, natural da economia, seja capaz de superar a pobreza e as desigualdades. E no campo da saúde se requer políticas públicas, não apenas do sistema de saúde, mas políticas públicas intersetoriais, água, esgoto, emprego, todos, todos os componentes desse digamos, desse puzzle, né? que é, hoje, nós, eu prefiro sempre apresentar, em vez de algo todo certinho, né? na realidade, o que nós temos é que existe uma interpenetração muito grande entre os ODSs. E quase todos os ODSs deste puzzle têm a ver com saúde. Se nós realizarmos as metas dos objetivos do desenvolvimento sustentável, nós teremos saúde. Daí, junto com, obviamente, a realização do ODS-3, que é o ODS de saúde. Mas, insisto, nós precisamos, para isso, de coordenação de políticas públicas em prol da equidade, que são claramente conhecidas no mundo, são evidências imensas que já foram uh, os cientistas todos de diversas áreas já conseguiram produzir. Muito obrigado. Bem, muito obrigada, Paulo. Eu agora chamo a Alison. Now I call Alison Lucondo, our third speaker. Also to, also to address one of the many dimensions, mainly food. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I, uh, now I will have to figure out how this works. Okay, so um, I was at first uh, a little uh, uh, worried that maybe my talk today will not fit within this, um, with this session because I work really on sustainable food systems. And so I'm very happy to be able to say that I do have something to contribute positively to this debate because of the preceding presentations. So thank you very much for that. Um, what I'm going to talk about is to begin with positioning uh, the question of poverty and the question of food within how poverty has often been uh, discussed in terms of food, in terms of uh, food insecurity. So um, following the first uh, World Food Summit in 19... Uh, not the first, but the World Food Summit in 1996, uh, countries decided that they were going to um, begin to report and, and, and engage and create targets towards uh, the reduction of uh, food insecurity, and they began to create the first indicators that were um, used globally and comparatively on this. The... Um, Uh, as you can see, what they had set out in, in terms of 99 was the, was the first report uh, released by FAO. And uh, you can see that these numbers had uh, the number of um, food insecure, which was defined in terms of the uh, prevalence of um, undernourishment, which is basically uh, an indicator calculated around calories uh, available to, to individuals. And uh, the first numbers there were above uh, uh, around 706, 800, excuse me, I can't read from here, 800, uh, 800 million uh, back in uh, 1995, and their projections, and in order to meet the targets set out in 1996, it had to go all the way down, um, I don't think that works either, uh, down to 400 uh, million. In 2017, What we see is um, that uh, actually the numbers are still at the levels um, of uh, 1990, 1996, 1999. Um, indeed, actually, there has uh, been a decrease over that uh, past 10 years. And what the, this report declared was that this 10-year uh, decrease in uh, food insecurity is actually coming to, a, to an end. 
And this is because of uh, conflicts, um, climate change, the uh, uh, changing nature of, uh, uh, of, um, of uh, the different food systems. And so a number of the things that were going on, excuse me, also the, the economic downturns at the time, all of these uh, 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 broader social uh, components were influencing and stopping the progression that had been made. In 2018, this was confirmed um, and uh, showed indeed that we are going up in terms of food insecurity. Um, so we have this basic background of we were making progress. Things have, uh, we, we've erupted in, in, in uh, dealing with questions of climate change now, dealing with um, conflict in a number of areas and also um, uh, climate change is uh, particularly important, and this we heard also this morning. But something else is, is happening here as well, because the terms of uh, the debate are changing. So while the prevalence of undernourishment is what has been traditionally used uh, to determine this notion of uh, food insecurity, after more than 20 years, the second uh, uh, global conference on nutrition was finally held again in Rome. And it was reinforced the idea that the nutritional um, components of diets is, are fundamentally important to determining uh, good nutrition or malnutrition. Um, the Eat Lancet report just came out also uh, talking about this. And we have a recent tweet from last week of uh, the Director General of uh, the FAO saying that, okay, we know that, fun that hunger comes from conflict, but you know, uh, we have to deal with obesity. We have to deal with these other health crises that are making it difficult for uh, us to actually have good diets, healthy populations. And so in addition to this, um, there's also been an introduction of a new indicator. And this is a, the indicator that's now um, been introduced into SDG uh, 2.1.2. Uh, and uh, this is the food, experience, uh, food insecurity experience uh, scale. And what it does is it's no longer based on government data that's reported about the number of calories available uh, to the populations. It is a, a global survey that's carried out, that uh, the original ones were carried out with Gallup. And so they're, rep they're nationally representative surveys that are carried out. And they administer these eight simple questions to individuals in order to understand their experience of food insecurity. And the result, and you can begin to see that these are already uh, in use across the world. The very first one was created in upstate New York. Then it was actually Brazil that adopted it afterwards and turned it into a national um, experience scale that contributed to the Brazilian um, uh, reporting on this topic. And then it's moving across the world and it's been adopted by FAO and also within the SDGs as a way to change the dialogue that we're having about what it means to be food insecure. So what has happened over uh, the past 50 years that we've been discussing this question of uh, food insecurity and its link with poverty and hunger? And we heard this also this morning. A lot of the discussion is about production. We have to increase production. We have to create high, the, the greater availability of food uh, and stability of those, um, those elements. But what the recent debates are actually showing us is that we're beginning finally to also consider the consumption aspect um, of, of what is going on. And so um, the work that I do actually is involved within SDG 12. And uh, why SDG 12? Um, it's because if we don't understand who's responsible for ensuring both sustainable production and sustainable con consumption, we're not going to be able to fix the problems we have in production or consumption or the linkages between them. Because right now, it's not clear who is responsible for increasing production, who is responsible for in, uh, reducing consumption or changing consumption. How do all of those uh, different aspects fit together? There's a new index that's also come out um, uh, recently uh, to try to look at uh, a food system uh, sustainability as a different uh, type of indicator that can be used to help us to better understand these questions of how poverty, particularly in relationship to questions of access, and um, 
and the food system itself are linked together and influencing the, the ability of uh, uh, different populations to be able to have uh, sustainable and um, equitable uh, food systems. So um, as you can see here, they're beginning to, I don't know if that, nope, sorry. Um, so uh, they are beginning to look at and compare countries based on uh, three, three uh, main areas of criteria, based on food losses and waste, which is an important aspect of a food system, and um, uh, sustainable production as well as nutritional challenges that the different countries are dealing with. And in that, you see that they're beginning to deal with these questions of malnutrition. And so some of the, over, um, uh, the overweight and the other uh, health-related and food-related, diet-related um, health issues are being taken into consideration in these new metrics. Um, within, the, uh, within the auspices of the sustain, uh, SDG 12, a network has been created, uh, launched by, initially by UN Environment, uh, but it's set up as a multi-stakeholder uh, um, network. It's called the One Planet Network, and it works with all of the different elements that are included within SDG 12, such as tourism, uh, public procurement, buildings and construction, and there is one program on sustainable food systems. And so what we are doing within this uh, program is uh, it's co-led by um, two NGOs, WWF, HIVOS, the government of South Africa and the government of, of uh, Switzerland, as well as having a multi-actor steering committee and then over 100 partners who, who have joined already who have made commitments to doing, taking action to put into place sustainable food systems. And we have uh, five different uh, groups who are based on uh, uh, different stakeholder groups uh, government, uh, private sector, civil society, uh, research, and um, international organizations. So um, just to kind of explain a little bit what I'm talking about in terms of a food system, um, and that's gone automatically a bit too fast. So the HLPE report um, uh, uh, put together this idea of, uh, of, a, of a schematic of how we can define what a food system is and what are some of the challenges we're deal with when we talk about food systems. And what that um, little uh, animation was doing was to say that often when we think about linking production and consumption, we think about a, a value chain, a supply chain, basically just the market steps that take the food from, uh, the, the, um, from the farm to the table. But actually, uh, the food system is much more complex than that because we have a lot of different elements that are linking to the, uh, the ability for, uh, uh, for people around the world to be able to ensure their food security through the way that they eat and how they um, eat that food. So what we're concerned with mostly are these middle elements here. So not only is it the actual market uh, relationships that bring the food to the table, but it's the food environments which condition the choices of consumers, the types of diets that they're eating that then lead to different uh, types of nutrition and health outcomes, as well as social economic and environmental impacts of all of these uh, uh, ways of eating and ways of organizing themselves. So um, now I'm going to talk about the empirical work that we've been doing to try to better understand where these changes are actually being made. So um, uh, in 2013, I started a participatory research project with FAO, um, so with INRA and F FAO, to begin to study what some, are the, some of the innovations are that we can find around the world of people who are actually putting into practice, moving from rhetoric into action, into creating a, particularly a local food systems based on um, the reorganization of these different elements of a food system. Because we have to understand and remember that food systems are not, there is not one food system. We have a global food system, but within that, we have many different layers of multiple forms of food systems where there are interactions between different types of producers, different types of consumers, different types of intermediaries, and uh, policy, uh, policies influence them in different ways. And so you can talk about a global food system, national food systems, and a number of sub-national and local food systems. What we began to study are at the local level. These are small, um, small initiatives where the producers and consumers, for the most part, know each other, 
and they are trying to change the way in which they work together. And so um, what we uh, basically found is that there's a huge uh, diversity uh, of ways in which they are selling their food, getting their food from, um, from the production to the consumption. And I do want to point out a lot of this uh, is so we were working with those producers who are considered agroecological. They're engaging in diversified farming. They're engaged in sometimes organic, but not always organic, linked through these um, uh, working <coughs> ecological <coughs> approaches to farming that are uh, highly sustainable. And a lot of people, the, a lot of literature assume that these types of uh, producers, the, the food that they go to goes to rich consumers in urban areas. This is not what we found. We found, particularly in these cases, that we asked um, all of the people that we interviewed for, for this particular study um, how, they, how they were uh, positioned themselves in terms of income uh, related to all of the other people within their communities, whether they were uh, at the same, let's say, average income level or higher or lower. And within the initiatives, you do have differences. Uh, some, uh, there's always some people who are, who are a bit higher and some people who are a bit lower, but overall these are diversified and it's not just, let's say, rich producers selling to rich consumers, but you have also poor producers selling to poor consumers as well. It depends on how they've organized themselves and the uh, objectives of their initiatives. So um, I will say just very quickly two words. Uh, on some of the definitions that we use that will help to better understand the way that we've, talk, we've been talking about these initiatives. We see innovation as a journey from an idea to a user. We don't consider it a, um, a term that can be synonymous with technology. It's a process. And particularly for most innovations, you need to reorganize the social con con uh, context of it, the institutions, the way in which people are working together, the way they are organizing themselves, and, the, and particularly the rules. And why is this important for the food system and for markets? Because markets are basically these collective devices that allow compromises to be reached, not only about the nature of the goods to produce and distribute, but also the value that we give to them. We use price as a, a determinant of value, but there are also many other values that are important in determining what that price is. So um, I'm going to go very quickly through this because I realize that I have <laughs> very few minutes left. What we looked at is we identified these innovative mechanisms that are at work in constructing these food systems. And there were three that we identified. The first one are participatory guarantee systems, which are alternative forms of certification that are not relying upon a third party form of certification where you pay an external, uh, um, uh, an external company to come and check up on your farm to ensure that you are being sustainable. But they are organized and they begin specifically within the group itself based on knowledge and relationships between producers and consumers and local extension agents. They use local and national knowledge. Uh, the, the initial legitimacy that these uh, systems form comes from within the group and then they seek outside recognition and they create new local markets based on direct contact with consumers, farm visits, farmers markets, internet sales and supermarkets. And what they have done is that they have changed the rules for organic production based on the local agroecosystems. Um, and they have uh, created an internal organization and sharing of roles and responsibilities among different people in order to actually allocate collectively the responsibility for producing, producing sustainably and consuming sustainably as well. Um, uh, we had the case from Bolivia. I'm going to skip over my cases because my time is limited, so I will just explain th these mechanisms. You can ask me about uh, the examples later. So focus on uh, in, uh, multi-actor innovation platforms which are being used around the world. Uh, these are set up usually to introduce or to work on a new, a new technology. But they're, they're usually set up um, first uh, by either extension agents or uh, through farmer groups who are interested in adopting a new technology. And it's really focused on farmer-led experimentation in the ones that we have looked at. Uh, they begin uh, with partnerships, uh, with local research and training, and they use national and international knowledge to promote these uh, practices and techniques. And the legitimacy comes from inside, and they change, they create these markets 
for safe products. Uh, this has been a, a particularly important aspect uh, in terms of food safety for these initiatives. And they have changed the rules in, in, in uh, how uh, the extension agencies are able to provide um, services to these producers. And um, finally, the community supported agriculture is not uh, this, uh, what we looked at are those initiatives that are highly embedded within the communities themselves. And so they came out of a community initiative with a group of interested uh, community members who mobilized their own resources uh, to uh, build up a system. And here we were in Trinidad and Tobago uh, with, a, with an approach that they used to create employment for all uh, members of the community by creating a multifunctional, um, uh, multifunctional uh, food system. So um, the key messages uh, that we have come out of this is that there is an importance of autonomy uh, for the actors in these systems in order to be able to uh, innovate and be able to um, uh, uh, create these local food systems. So too much top-down regulation is not helping them, but they have to be able to deal with flexible uh, forms of regulation. Um, uh, and so uh, they rely upon social values, and this is what I had mentioned earlier about the fact that they are, there has been specific, um, let's say, missioning that goes along with the building that we're in, visioning of where they're trying to go with the changes they're making in these systems. So to reduce poverty, to uh, increase uh, employment, to uh, improve the livelihoods, and to create food sovereignty were very uh, important for these uh, producers. There's, uh, in terms of the roles that people take on and the responsibilities and how they allocate that for the different actors in the system to ensure sustainability, there is not, it's not easy to identify, let's say the private sector has this responsibility or the public sector has that responsibility. It really depends on what they're trying to achieve and how they go about creating their internal rules that enable them to collaborate. And so we could not identify, let's say, this in, this core intermediary or facilitator who was going to solve all of the problems and make the, the system uh, responsible. So um, we had, uh, we had uh, uh, at the FAO um, agroecology uh, meetings in, uh, in Kunming, China, and in Europe, in, in, in Brussels, we had uh, put together, uh, based on this participatory project, a list of six RIs, we called them that would help to support these the emergence of these types of initiatives because these are small they, they, and they've had specific support from policy and others to be able to um, uh, uh, move forward. And so I'm going to leave these up here for you and I can share them afterwards and uh, we can talk more about this. But basically, it has to be work done at all levels of the system. It cannot be just production. It cannot be just consumption. It has to be also those linkages between them and particularly the knowledge that we're relying upon to enable us to develop the, the, the new ways of valuing and uh, revaluing uh, agriculture and food in our uh, societies. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alison. Okay, we now have time for comments, but let me start just observing that maybe it's my training as a political scientist, but all the three presentations, which were extremely useful, made me think of the, how crucial the connection between knowledge and politics is. Uh, with regards to the first presentation, you mentioned that 85% of those under severe poverty are in the rural areas. And I, that led me to a personal reflection because just last week I was in another seminar and a geographer said that the rural is dead, has disappeared. Because he was, of course, commenting upon urbanization, etc. Now I think the disappearance is political. We are living in the countryside those who are in a desperate condition. 
and uh, thinking about what you were saying, uh, this idea that particular uh, uses have been made of the index. Of course, this reflects the conditions of different contexts. But I also wonder if we could think of an index to evaluate the, what are the outputs, depending on which aspects do you maximize. Because of course, those, should, those choices that are made contextually do not only reflect the, the material conditions, they also reflect choice, political choice. And of course, some are more used for than others. Um, my colleague, Paulo, I think is a colleague because what he made was mainly a political science presentation with his uh, medical angle. Uh, of course, capitalism has to be get responsible. But I always think of a definition of a famous political scientist whose name I forgot, I'm sorry, but he says that politics is the, is the way to alter, to change market results. That means that we are always doing politics. Even the liberals, when they say let the, let the enterprise con let the show, they are making a political effort so that this happens. And given these conditions, I think it's, I mean, criticism is very useful and I share the criticism. But how can we think the other way around? What are the opportunities we have to change the existing market conditions? And Alison, I have one question for you. We are closer because we share the sociological community. Uh, you were mentioning, the, I mean, I, of course, it's crucial to have sustainable production and consumption. But if I didn't, maybe I, get, I, I got it wrong, but I have the impression that you are focusing consumption from the perspective of the producers. And I know that food habits are extremely difficult to change. I know because I remember a, a specific research that MIT has led on that, that one of the most difficult things on earth to change are the way people like to eat. So how can we think of sustainable consumption from the perspective of the, of the consumer? Okay, you don't have to answer me, it's just immediate reflections. If you prefer to open the floor or to discuss among the yourselves, it's fine. Hello, okay. Um, as you prefer, if, if you want to collect more questions from public? Yeah, I or? think it's better. Let's give yeah? the people oh, okay. a chance to and talk. And then yes. uh, we can yeah. yes. also include. Yes. You need the phone. Who, who is having the phone, mm -hmm. the microphone? Uh, thank you. Uh, just on, uh, on, on this last point that you mentioned about consumption, um, I think it's a very, very critical problem and I'm very, very glad that you mentioned that we should not only talk about production, we should also talk about consumption. And I would like you to say a few words uh, about the correlation between the two. Um, you know, if the, the producers would like to produce more because they would like others to consume. Uh, this intricate relationship between the two I think has to be clarified. And the second point is um, I really hope that when you talk about consumption, you also talk about underconsumption. You see, these are two, yeah, the, the communities that you deal with when you talk about poverty is that they consume less, <laughs> that you don't have the food. So I don't know about, I mean, research-wise, how you actually deal with that as well. Thank you. Uh, to maximize time, let us collect three questions and then give a chance to respond. Yeah. Uh, I, I would like to thank you because you, you made me think a lot today. But uh, you have studies very interesting. But action, I just felt in the last lecture. And I would suggest you and suggest for all to elect here the main points 
of research for science to go through poverty in action. I have four, but I won't, I won't say it now. I prefer to hear from you. What, what are the priorities, priority in action for uh, the reduction of poverty and inequality? Uh, not to, uh, we know that the studies to map, to, to, to see where are the poverty, what is poverty, is very important. But elect the priorities, I think it's, it's very important too. Okay, thank you. Let's collect one more. Yeah. Um, it's a question for Maria. You, you mentioned the poverty indicators. Two of them were um, schooling, um, years of schooling and attendance at school. Is there any allowance made on the quality of that education? Okay, let's answer those three and then... Okay, well, thank you very much for all the questions. Um, first, uh, let me respond to Elisa. Um, so, the global MPI has done the, probably the best possible with the data availability. It is inspired by San Amartya Sen's um, framework of capabilities. So, in as much as possible, we were trying to incorporate indicators of functionings over um, access. But in the case of the schooling, for example, these functionings are quite limited. As these indicators are quite limited as measures of functionings. In the case of health, I think they are a bit better because it's nutrition and child mortality. Uh, and the others are access to services. Um, but so it was highly restricted by data availability. Of course, national governments have shaped and, and Latin America has been a leading region, uh, their own national MPIs, and actually SDG 1.2 refers to national MPIs. Um, so each country can shape priorities, and they can even shape a survey according to those priorities. So if they wanted to uh, put measures of outputs, which I think relate quite closely to what Amartya Sen would call functionings, what we are able to do and be, uh, then that can uh, get finer tuning within each country. Still, I think the global MPI shows very acute deprivations that still bother a lot of people in the world. Um, the question about quality of education, no, it does not include anything about quality because um, surveys that collect information on quality of education cannot be linked to these other surveys that we use. Uh, but certainly, um, it is a very important matter, and all I can say is that for sure if a child is not attending the school, <laughs> it is neglected any quality of education, but certainly it would be a step forward. As per action, I think that it's quite, insp um, I mean, one does not have to oversize or, or, or um, put out of dimension a tool. It's a tool. But it is a tool that can inspire action, I think. So it could set priorities. That clearly, access to some basic services are on top of priority. And nutrition is the other priority, I would say, um, if one had to select. But that's a particular view. And again, the tool does not have to be on top of, of the purpose. It's just a potential indication. So. Okay, um, so thank you for these. These are helpful because then I can clarify some things that I went through too quickly. <laughs> so I think one of the most important aspects of, in, in the end we studied um, initiatives in 20 different countries across Latin America, Africa, Asia, and then two in Europe, uh, and so, two, three in Europe and Central Asia. And what you might have noticed or you might have missed on one of my graphs is that self-consumption was in 100% of our cases. We forget that producers also consume. And in these initiatives, they were the first consumers of what they produced. And this goes back to the type of agriculture that, they're, that, they're, that they are doing, in that they are able to produce food that they can actually eat. And that's not just being sold off. And so there's also a, a, a certain politics there as well, in terms of what these uh, types of producers are doing. 
So that is one aspect in terms of the consumption that uh, was fundamental to the, let's say, the, the sustainability of their initiative. In terms of the food habits and, and the underconsumption concerns, there, this is why the, the notion of food environments and uh, practices are important, because consumers can only make the choices that are available to them that they are actually able to access. And so the way in which this was mentioned also this morning, the logistics, where retailers are, how they can purchase that or get it through trading or, or bartering or things like this, that we, we see all of these different approaches. How their actual environment within which they live is set up determines what types of choices they can make. And practices, food practices, culinary practices are collective. And so the more we focus on changing individual behaviors, I think we're missing the point. Because how we eat is very collective. We often, we rarely, we rarely eat alone, we often eat with others, and what we eat, and particularly in terms of, of a household, what the person who cooks, usually the woman, determines what everyone else in the household is going to eat. And so we have a lot of uh, social aspects of how we eat that also influences the changes that can be made in consumption behavior. And in terms of the underconsumption, if you don't have anything to eat, you're, you're not, your choices aren't going to matter much. Um, what we've been looking at is some of the approaches that have been uh, developed in small initiatives to create solidarity economies. And so there is uh, the, the, um, the absolute poverty that we saw in pictures this morning are they, those poor people are not in these initiatives. But there are, let's say, marginal poor or a, a very low income, depending on, on the country. And so they are not perhaps getting enough food. And so some of the initiatives have uh, changed pricing mechanisms, because this goes back to the, to the questions about the market and how we can change uh, the rules of markets. The, where there's been negotiated prices uh, between and this, of course, relies upon a social cohesion within a group to be able to do this, that they're willing to have different pricing mechanisms and uh, create solidarity economies for sharing between those who are less well-off and those are, who are greater, higher well-off. These are rare, but they are emerging. And so these are things that should be, let's say, studied a bit more to understand when and why this works and if these, these can be expanded to other situations. Um, in terms of the priorities for science, I mean, I, I, I am a strong believer in participatory research. And this is something that I do. This is something that we practice, uh, particularly at INRA. This is really engaging. There's a, <laughs> there, there's a big movement uh, in Europe in particular, but within, in, within France to really begin, begin but it, it, maybe it happened before, but really begin to listen, particularly to producers, to consumers. What are these questions? What are the problems that they have in terms of uh, uh, resolving it on the farm or resolving in their access and then trying to uh, um, find solutions together. So. Bem, eu queria uh, agradecer a provocação da, da Elisa porque não, indiscutivelmente a saúde, nós não estamos falando só de doença, a saúde é uma disciplina eminente, bem, objeto eminentemente social, Elisa. Ele tem o um importantíssimo componente biológico, não é? óbvio, mas ele, a saúde da população, a saúde enquanto isso é uma expressão da vida, é fundamentalmente social. E aí a gente tem eh, as ciências que podem contribuir no campo da saúde, são as ciências biológicas, biomédicas, né? conhecida desde a antiga microbiologia, a genômica, ou seja, uma quantidade enorme de cientistas trabalham em torno da saúde humana. É, as ciências clínicas são dedicadas àquelas pessoas é, ou populações que estão doentes. E as ciências sociais aplicadas, entre as quais a economia política, a demografia, o, a gestão de sistema de saúde, governança, é aquilo que nós denominaríamos 
as disciplinas da saúde pública. Então, nós temos três dimensões para discutir saúde. A dimensão biológica, a dimensão clínica e a dimensão uh, da saúde pública. Todos, todas elas interligadas. E eu queria fazer menção à ação, que é a minha, que é a nossa é, é, participante levantou. O Brasil deu um exemplo muito especial de 2002 a 2015, quando organizou, em primeiro lugar, para enfrentar os problemas sociais e que impactou profundamente na saúde, a, o programa de transferência de renda, o Bolsa Família. Nós temos estudos mostrando que o Bolsa Família, mas também não só o Bolsa Família, o programa Opportunity no México e outros programas de transferência de renda, quando eles melhoram as condições de vida da família, com condicionamentos em saúde, por exemplo, tem que vacinar a senhora, a mulher grávida, tem que ir ao serviço de saúde, as crianças têm que ser vacinadas, ou seja, têm que permanecer na escola, ou seja, o programa de transferência condicionada de renda que o Brasil implementou reduziu, foi responsável por uma enorme redução num proxy indicador da saúde, que é a mortalidade de menores de cinco anos. O benefício de prestação continuada, que agora estão querendo derrubar, ele estendeu a vida dos idosos. E ele é um programa de previdência, ele é um programa de transferência de renda, mostrando que esta composição disciplinar para estudar os efeitos sobre a saúde humana de políticas sociais e de políticas de saúde, políticas de sistema de saúde, são extremamente importantes. E nós tivemos resultados espetaculares, não só no Brasil, pela implementação, um, do programa de transferência de renda, da benefício de prestação continuada, que são programas de renda. Mas, quando nós implantamos no Brasil o programa de saúde da família, quer dizer, um programa de atenção básica, hoje considerado exemplar, eu estive em Astana, capital da, da, do Cazaquistão, num grande encontro sobre atenção primária de saúde, ou atenção básica, que agora os resultados daquela conferência estão indo não para a Organização Mundial da Saúde, estão indo para a Assembleia Geral das Nações Unidas, para a UNGA de 2019 em Nova York. Os chefes de Estado chamaram o tema da atenção primária e o tema da cobertura universal, que nós precisamos chamar preferimos chamar acesso universal, que oferecer não quer dizer que che vai chegar às pessoas. Acesso é diferente de cobertura. Isso é uma terminologia técnica. Nada técnico, é bastante político, aliás. Então, quando é, se, se, isso tudo derivou do campo da, de estudos interdisciplinar da saúde pública, que incluía ciências biológicas, ciências clínicas e ciências sociais aplicadas. Essa convergência da ciência, das disciplinas em torno do tema da saúde, foi que solucionou a questão da saúde. Porque vieram os recursos biológicos, vieram os medicamentos, vieram as vacinas, veio a nova governança, veio o programa de atenção básica, veio o programa de imunização, e isso é o resultado de vocês, nosso, isto é, o resultado de cientistas, que no campo das ciências aplicadas, sociais aplicadas, que no campo da medicina clínica, das da, da ciências clínicas e no campo das ciências biológicas, foram capazes de compor um belíssimo conjunto de cientistas que levaram à ação com resultados espetaculares do ponto de vista coletivo e do ponto de vista da qualidade de vida também de cada indivíduo. Então, eu sou um profundo eu respeito profundamente a capacidade interdisciplinar para dar resultados no campo da saúde. E nós podemos avançar, quero cumprimentar a Academia Brasileira de Ciências, quero cumprimentar ah, também a Academia Internacional, quer dizer, o, o, 
o grupo internacional todo que está junto com a Academia de Ciências realizando essa reunião, porque se nós soubermos enfrentar juntos o, o tema completo dos 17 ODS, ou seja, da Agenda 2030, sempre multidisciplinarmente, a meu ver, nós vamos gerar ações e vamos gerar transformações em prol da saúde e da qualidade de vida da população global, além da população de cada país. Ok, thank you very much. Thank you to you all. I'm sorry I have to stop here in order not to penalize the, the next engagers. Thank you so much for your participation. I think it was a wonderful starting of our whole of our discussion.